Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh episode of the Keep Coding podcast. I am extremely happy today because I have one of the basically, I think after David Fowler, the second most requested guests uh, for the show. Actually, funny enough, the reason why he's here today is because of a tweet. We're going to say this, tell this story in a second, but uh, Stephen Tobe, welcome to the show. Thank you so, so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so the the story of how you this this specific episode came to be is so funny because there was this tweet of another episode, I think the one with Jeff Fritz, and someone in the comments said, "Oh, I would <laughs> sacrifice my firstborn to have Stephen Tobin on the on the show," and I I think I liked it, and I never never actually replied to it because I'm like, ah, Stephen, sometime in the future, you know, I, I'd probably. I probably have him, but I don't know if he would come now. And then you emailed me and you said, you want to have this? Like, or you actually said, no one should be harmed in the process of, of making this, but we should definitely have this. So I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's book it, let's book it, let's do it. So uh, yeah, th thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to talk a lot about performance today. And if you're tuning in for a Stephen Toll podcast with me, and you don't expect stupid, nerdy performance, micro, like nanosecond stuff, then probably go, don't go, stay. But you, you know what I mean? We're going to talk about some some pretty advanced stuff. I have some very interesting questions. Um, but I have interesting answers. Yeah, I, I hope you do, because many people, I'm sure many people know your name um, and and your, 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 your image, but um, Many of you who don't know you maybe know you as this guy who writes this stupidly long performance blog every year when a new .NET version is out. Um, and even though I knew your name before you started doing that all the way back in .NET Core 1.0, um, you... <sighs> it's interesting how this blog gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And now .NET 7, we are at what, like 75,000 words, including co code samples, which is just insane. So what the hell is my is question? question? Yeah, that's my first question. What the hell? <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, I mean, um, I've been working on .NET Core since there was a .NET Core. I've, I've been, you know, working in, in .NET land for a long time, and then I kind of took a break for it and, and went to a different part of Microsoft and then came back just about the time that we were starting to work on, people were starting to think about, you know, what, well, maybe we should take this .NET thing open source and cross-platform. So I started working on it uh, immediately. Uh, and my first responsibility was basically bringing up the libraries on Linux. So making sure that all these things that were built for Windows, you know, would be able to run there. But in addition to this cross-platform open source focus, we added to that very quickly a, a performance focus and basically wanted to make sure that this was a screaming fast, you know, viable for all kinds of workloads, uh, modern platform. Um, and even with all this perf work that was going into it, we weren't really talking about it all that much. So it got to be around .NET Core 2.0 and I'm looking around going, wow, look at all this stuff that's happening. We should make sure people know about it. So I wrote a, a blog post performance improvements in .NET Core. And that was about .NET Core 2.0, I think. Um, and it was pretty well received and it was, I don't know, 30 pages or something. Um, and then I did it again for .NET Core 2.1, which although it was a, a minor release version-wise, it was a massive release uh, feature and performance-wise. I'm not entirely sure why it wasn't, you know, it didn't get its own major version number, but it's neither here nor there. And so the blog post started growing. Uh, in large part because the amount of work that was going into performance started growing. But then I started realizing as well that, you know, just talking about what was new, it's nice. Like it helps educate people. It helps inform people, hopefully um, evangelize a little bit so that they actually want to start taking dependencies on some of the new features or change their code to take advantage of where we invested in Perf. But there was this other aspect that started to emerge where we we were learning all these lessons about how to make things faster and we were employing all these you know uh, approaches to make things faster and all of those in one way shape or form end up being relevant to other people's code as well right so it's not just we use this technique and it made 
XYZ class faster, you should use XYZ class and benefit from it. From it. It's in addition to using XYZ class, those techniques are probably also usable in your own libraries and your own applications somewhere. And so I started not only taking it as an opportunity to evangelize and explain, but also to sort of detail the, the why and the how behind it, um, which is a, where a lot of the length comes from. I mean, in addition to, you know, having th hundreds of improvements to cover, I also spend more time covering many of them to sort of highlight how it came about and what were the decisions that went into it. So hopefully people walk away from the post, not just with a an understanding of what we did, but also like learning new techniques along the way. Um, and I think I've doubled down on that more and more in every release. And I, and I don't want people to have to walk away from the post and go consult a college textbook. So I try and explain the background behind various changes. You know, we made this change in the JIT. What does that mean? And you know, how is it relevant and what is it actually doing? And what are the data structures involved so that you can kind of read this one thing and not have to leave and then forget to come back. Um, and so, as you said, I think, you know, if you print a PDF, the .NET 7 one, uh, it was about 230 pages or something. Um, <laughs> of course, I, it has been consistently growing. So at some point, I'm going to just, you know, my fingers are going to get too tired to write anymore, but um, hopefully no time soon. So, you know, I've, I've already got my list of things to, to cover for .NET 8, and it's an ever-growing list. So hopefully it'll be another good post. Yeah, from what I understand, obviously you don't, just sit down and one day you write this, right? As you're working throughout the year, you, I'm assuming you have some sort of document and you keep adding. Uh, is that the, right? I add, I add the things like uh, links to the things that I want to cover. Um, I haven't yet actually, and maybe I should <laughs> done any of the writing in advance. I'll usually just take my list of a thousand links and sit down in, you know, July or August and go through it and start writing. And it probably took me for the .NET 7 one, it probably took me a good um, 40 hours of work to do it. Um, so it takes a while. Jesus Christ. Um, but it's a labor of love. I mean, some of that is work time. Some of that is personal time just because I, I really enjoy it. I'd be very interested to know, obviously, I don't know if you know that, or if you, even if you could share it, if you wanted to, uh, but I'd be very interested to know how long people who read that blog, how long do they stay on the page? Um, I've seen stats for it and it's hours. Uh, really? Yeah. That's really good because I, I assume there's going to be sort of two people reading this. Some of them would just start and then go to one stack replacement. And the moment they start reading there, they're going to be like, okay, whatever, I don't need this. And tap out. I, mean, that, I, think, I think the average time was something like 400 minutes or something around that. Um, I mean, it's a long, it's a long thing. And I'm sure some of that is, I don't know exactly, you know, what kind of polling is done to ensure the person is still scrolling and, you know, reading, but, um, uh, I mean, maybe they got up and, you know, did something else or they had it in the background and they would switch to it every once in a while. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a long post. It is chock full of information. My writing style is pretty dense. So I think there's a lot of information in between all the code snippets and whatnot. So it, it makes sense that it would take someone a while to get through. It takes me a long time to get through. I mean, I yeah. you know, I end up doing several review passes. I, I kind of write stream of consciousness, and then I'll go back and I'll revise it in places where it doesn't make sense. Um, but I can only do that so many times. You know, I probably only go through it like two, maybe three times before I'm like, I can't read this thing again published. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, wow, that that is, I would assume you just write it as you go, but sitting down and just having a crack I, I, at it. I contemplated doing it. The problem is that, you know, there are some things that we plan in advance, but a lot of times the perf improvements are organic. They come about um, because we got requests for things or it wasn't even us doing it. Someone submitted a pull request from, you know, externally to improve something. And if I were to sit down in January and write about the improvements that had come about this, you know, October through January, Things come about in February and March and April that would need to be, in, should be inserted into that content, and it changes the flavor and the nature of the content, and the end-to-end -end story for what's happened ends up changing. So I could write a probably you know a few paragraphs, but the the crafting of it, which is, I mean, I try and bring sort of a a storyteller, you know, mindset to the piece. Yeah. 
um, I find I have trouble doing that piecemeal. I kind of want to sit down and look at all of all the improvements I want to cover and organize them and categorize them and think about, all right, well, here's how I want to order it. And here's the story I want to tell here and so on. Yeah. What's some feedback you've gotten after, especially after seven, uh, on and that blog? My browser was the was the number one. Was well, slowing down the browser. I, if some people couldn't open it, especially in their mobile browsers. The the browser would crash. <laughs> wow. Um, so hopefully, uh, all the browser manufacturers have fixed their browsers for um, for eight. Um, <laughs> no, I mean the 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 primary piece of feedback that in general I receive is one of thanks and appreciation, which I love. Um, uh, people, you know, super excited about the release, looking forward, they say I'm looking forward to this post every year. Yeah. Like it's one thing that I read to educate myself. Um, and that makes, you know, that makes me feel really good. I really appreciate it because I, I, it is a, one of my key goals is to help the general .NET ecosystem however I can, conveying all these lessons learned that we have so that other people can benefit. Um, and then there's also a, you know, a, a, it's easy to forget things that we did months ago. And so taking the time to sit down and write it helps me to remember, oh, wow, this is a pretty awesome release. Like, look at all these things we've accomplished. So those are some of the main pieces of feedback. I'll get nits like, oh, you should split this up into multiple posts uh, kind of feedback. Yeah. I don't really want to do that. I like the, yeah. you know, people can choose to read it on however they want to choose to read it. Um, but uh, mainly it's, uh, wow, this is great. Thank you. And and I love that. Yeah. Co consistently, what I'm saying is more people comment on it as well. Like the engagement is higher year to year. So I, I find that very interesting because even though it's very good to know, I would say, and that's just a metric I'm pulling out of thin air. 95 to 98 percent of everyone reading this blog won't really need to worry about any of the like for most people right. you just increase the, the dotnet version and yeah. you get most of that just implicitly you don't need to know what happened yeah. but what i found is that when i talk about it and that's you know a niche in my channel as well talking about performance i inspired by your content and, and all those changes is people really engage with it even if you're talking about nanoseconds, yeah, you're going to have two camps. One is, what are you talking about? You're using a managed language for a reason. Why do you even care? And the other is, oh, wow. Uh, you know, now I have span and I can have managed pointers and whatever. And how do you, what, what do you feel about this as someone who's been in Microsoft for almost 22 years now and yeah. you've cut your teeth in the I have the name because it's a long one here. Uh, PAL Computing Platform Team. Yeah. And you were, you know, the await async guy, at least from your previous interviews and, and blogs, which I've been reading as well. Um, and even now with Value Task and the Configure Await um, FAQ that you've written. Uh, what do you think about this mindset that I don't need it and, oh, wow, I, I don't need it, but I really like it? Yeah. So let me, I'm going to answer that, but let me come back to a comment that you previously made about kind of the, the kinds of changes that one gets when they upgrade. So there's sort of three categories of these kinds of performance improvements. There's the ones where, like you said, you just upgrade and we changed implementation detail of things that you're already using and things get faster. And that's probably the, you know, 60% case of the kinds of improvements that go in. And then there's the upgrade and recompile. And because you recompile either improvements in the compiler or in source generators or new overloads that will cause you to bind to them instead or whatever, they then make your application run faster. And that's probably another 20% of the kinds of improvements that go in. And there's the third category of, in addition to upgrading and recompiling, you also need to change your code to take advantage of some kind of new functionality that, that we exposed. And that probably makes up the, the remaining 20%. Um, so that last category is relevant, I think, regardless of your mindset, right? It's, well, I'm do I was doing A, but now if I do B instead, my application will be better. And that can be better reliability, be uh, better correctness, it can be better performance, whatever. Like in the case of performance, if I change from this thing to that thing, my application just gets better. 
And just because you chose to use a productive language in a productive environment doesn't mean you also don't care about performance, right? We want to be able to have our cake and eat it too. We want to have something where we can quickly write our applications and also have them work really well. Um, the, the other ones are more of a education in terms of, you know, I, I've seen comments like, um, you know, I showed this blog post to my manager and as a result, we're going to upgrade, right? So it's, it, 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 it helps kind of grease the wheels of your application will just get faster, but only if you upgrade. So, you know, upgrade, um, I think there is a large aspect of many developers or developer because we're we're really interested even if we don't work on the low level stuff day to day we want to know what's under the covers we all took the data structures and algorithms class in you know whenever or uh studied how whatever work and we want to understand how that's impacting my higher level service that i work on on a day-to-day -day basis um from a comparison to you know you're working in a, I think I don't remember exactly the words you used, but you're working in a managed language. Why do you care about performance, right? You know, the C++ versus C Sharp. You know, a lot of the work we've been doing has been to try and remove that gap from a performance perspective. Um, you, We want you to be spend 99% of your time writing safe, reliable code where the underlying runtime protects you from this large swath of mistakes that are possible. And then we want to give you escape patches that allow you to, you know, for that core routine to really, you know, turn the turn the dial up to 11. Um, and in many situations, you can do as good or waving my hands even better than what you would get in, you know, if you were just writing this in, in C or C++. In fact, there are places where we've ported code that was C and C++ from the kind of native portion of the runtime up into managed code and seen performance boosts as a result. Now, it's not because C Sharp is inherently faster in any way than C++. Obviously, you can do anything in those languages. But part of the benefit of something having something being productive is that you can churn it faster, you can try things faster, you can experiment more. And whereas you might only write, you know, one thing one way and call it good enough if you're writing in c because you have this sort of safety safety net behind you and because you're able to do it faster you try more things and more people are willing to try things it's people are, you know in we get many more contributions to the managed portions of our code base than we do to the native portions of our code base and we're much more willing to accept PRs into managed portions of our code base than into native portions of our code base, because we know if we get the code review wrong, we still have the safety and security backstop that the runtime is providing for the managed portions. Whereas if we have an off by one error on the native side, that's probably a, a security vulnerability waiting to happen that we're going to have to patch down the road. Um, and so while you can absolutely for a particular architecture, for a particular platform, you can invariably write the code faster eventually be faster in C and C++. We find that there are many reasons why writing in C Sharp yields significant perf benefits, um, especially with all the work that's been done of late on vectorization and hardware intrinsics. We actually see a lot of researchers looking to .NET to experiment with um, their latest and greatest algorithms for SIMD because they can very quickly do it in C Sharp, whereas you know, in other languages that might be uh, a little more painstaking. Yeah, um, very long way to answer your question, but uh... no, no, it's uh, I love it. Um, very, very interesting perspective because as someone who does create content, when I talk about those things, you know, vectorization is one of the things I want to talk about. Um, usually, a comment I get, and that's the not the majority, it's the minority of the comments, but I do get the odd comment is, "Are you trying to scare new C sharp developers?" Because it it can look intimidating, and when you see someone with a following talking about such a such a way of writing C sharp, you think, oh, that's the way you should write C sharp, and you might think you're not good enough. So it's um, it's very interesting to see the feedback, but again, in its overwhelming majority, it's super positive. Yeah. Um, and and we don't expect the majority of developers to be using those those lower level types, right? We we want anyone who 
wants to use them to have a good experience using them. But 99 point whatever percent of developers will probably never use them and probably never should, not because they're not capable, but because it's not a good use of their time. Um, whereas we want to be using them ourselves and we want library developers using them as part of their implementations to ensure that when people, when other developers call the higher level routines, they're sort of implicitly taking advantage of all the goodness under the covers. You know, so we expose all these vectorization operations, but then we go and we, I know you did a video on link, right? We, we end up using it in uh, innumerable.sum. And if you happen to fall into the right pattern, then under the covers, it happens for you. Uh, or more generally, you know, with string dot index of, you don't have to understand that under the covers, we're using SSC2 or ABX2 or ARMS intrinsics or whatever. It just goes faster on whatever hardware you're running on. And that's because it's possible to express all of that in C sharp, we are able to, and other sort of, you know, uh, core library developers are doing so, and then everyone implicitly benefits. Yeah, re regarding the the whole link thing and the vectorization there, um, and I was planning to ask this later, but you've mentioned it quite a few times, so I, I might as well ask it now. We've seen span, we've seen the uses of structs, we've seen we've seen the team trying to use the stack as much as possible to eliminate as many heap allocations as possible. Um, is vectorization the next big thing to optimize performance in .NET? For certain kinds of workloads. Yes. So when we're dealing with huge data sets of... Yeah, I mean, it doesn't even need to be huge. It just can't be tiny. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're if you're processing bytes, right, you, you can vectorize the processing of as little as, say, 16 bytes. Uh, and actually, if, if you're not even talking about SIMD, you're just talking about you know, you know, normal, um, uh, certain operations on even, you know, ints and longs. Like if I have eight bytes, I can treat that as a single long. And for certain operations, I can do the operation on the long instead of on the individual bytes. And I can make it eight times faster or with the int and make it four times faster. So you can do things for even relatively small, uh, data sets where it kicks in is when you do it a lot, right? You know, if, if I have a gigabyte of data I'm processing and I can vectorize that, that's great. If I have a hundred bytes of uh, data, well, vectorizing, maybe I'm going to go from, you know, a hundred nanoseconds down to 10 nanoseconds or something. But unless I'm doing that a bazillion times, it's not going to really matter. But if you are doing it a bazillion times, it is. And a lot of the places that we end up employing vectorization are things like searching. Uh, and that happens all over the place. And if your application is really focused on searching, then you get much greater benefits. Um, or if you're doing certain kinds of uh, mathy kind of applications, matrix manipulation, um, graphics, uh, ML, you know, whatever it might be, those kinds of workloads really benefit. Whereas if you're doing sort of higher level business object, you can, okay, you're back. Cool. You'd never froze from me, so that's great. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I can still hear you. Um, that threw me off, but I have the next question in front of me, so I'm just might as well Sorry. ask it. Um, so, if you could isolate one feature of .NET or C# -sharp in the .NET Core era and now .NET five, six, seven, and soon to be eight, that really changed the game in performance. What would that be? Span. Span. Yep. I don't even need to think about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it has fundamentally changed the way that we write code and we think about code and we think about optimizations and we think about the APIs that we expose and we think about pretty much anything. The ability to represent a multitude of different data types in a single fashion, a single manner, allows you to write one routine that can process data from pretty much wherever it comes, whether it came from an array or a string or native memory from interop or on the stack or wherever, rather than having to be able to write, you know, um, different routines for each of those, we write a single routine rather than having to pass around not only the data, but also the offset and the count, uh, you just pass around this the the data structure, the span that includes those. And while that might seem trivial, well, okay, I can pass one thing instead of three, it means that 
the optimizers can focus on optimizations that more often than not uh, iterate through the entire you know region so the jit is very good at optimizing away bounds checks and things when you go from zero to the length of an array it's very good at doing it when you go from zero to the length of a span it's much less good at doing it when you go from some random offset in an array to for some random count um it can it can do so um but it, it you know it, it requires more analysis more code generated um and so having that single representation allows things to be optimized better um it allows us to I mean, because of that there are places where we would have otherwise dropped down to native code or we would have otherwise dropped down to unsafe code but because we get these optimizations applied anyway we just stick and manage world with our span and we get the same performance as we would have but with without having to give up the safety um the ability to uh take uh you know, um a sequence of one data type and treat it as a sequence of another data type and in a relatively safe fashion um, means that you avoid a whole bunch of costs that you would have had if you had you know an int array and you wanted to treat it as a byte array there's really no safe way to do that but with spans i can take a, a span of int and i can treat it as a span of byte and it's totally safe and you know it just works and so then I can have routines that are implemented in terms of span of byte. And you know, for certain kinds of algorithms, anything, what, no matter what kind of memory it came from or what data types were involved, it ends up going down to that one single implementation. So we end up dedicating our optimization time to that one thing, and it ends up applying to um, an order of magnitude more surface area than uh, it otherwise would have. So for example, kind of as an example to tie that all together, sorting of primitive types in .NET for a long time throughout all of .NET framework and up through .NET core, I don't know, three or something around there, um, maybe it was five. Sorting was implemented in the runtime in, in C++ or C. Um, with spans, we basically lifted out that implementation and changed it to be based purely based on span. So it's no longer based on array, now it's based on span. In doing so, all of the code became safe C-sharp code, fully bounds checked and whatnot, with the exception of one, maybe two core functions where we said for, in this particular case, the JIT is unable to see that the bounds checks can be eliminated even though it's safe. So we're gonna just use unsafe for that one portion. Um, everything else remains safe code. So we got the safety benefits. We avoided the costs and the overheads of transitioning from managed code into native code and back. Uh, which has even, you know, which costs a few nanoseconds or whatever on every transition, um, has impacts potentially on garbage collection, which trying to do stop the world kind of stuff. So we got rid of all that overhead. Then because it was implemented in terms of spans, we just took the array surface area and it's, it's just forwards right into the span implementation. And because we had the span implementation, we were also able to take link and direct links implementation into the spans implementation. So links order by also just picked up the same sorting implementation. And you have this sort of, these knock-on benefits um, as a result of that fundamental single type or two, if you count the read-only one as well. Um, we've been able to then expand the number of helpers that we offer in terms of that core type. Uh, and then the surface area that is able to consume those. So, you know, for example, I know you've covered regex before, right? Regex could only ever process strings. And if you had some data that you got from interop, maybe you're getting, you know, doing interop call, you get back some text from C or from Rust or from wherever, um, you wanted to process that with a regex, well, you had to copy it into a string first, right? So you had to allocate a string and, and copy it in. With spans, you can just create a, a read-only span of char around that data and pass it to regex now, right? And you, so you get, and, and regex is now replat. It's no longer based on strings internally. It's based on spans internally. And so anywhere you can get a span from, you can feed it into that. Uh, a huge amount of surface area on um, as extensions for spans for doing replacement and counting and searching and whatever else, sorting. Um, it has fundamentally changed the game. And this isn't even just for kind of the lower level stuff. Uh, it changes just simple things that developers can do in their own code. You, um, you're given a string and you want to, let's say it's a, a quoted name, Nick, 
right, in quotes. And you want to print out, hello, Nick, but you want to remove the quotes. Well, previously, you might have written in an interpolated string, you know, hello, comma, and then name dot substring one comma length minus two or whatever, right? But you're allocating this temporary substring in the process. Now you just say dot as span, same, same stuff. And maybe then you even use the nice C-sharp range syntax or whatever. And interpolated strings understand spans. You can just fill it in the hole. And that allocation is just eliminated. So you basically cut off half the cost, both in terms of allocation and, as it turns out, uh, generally CPU cost as well in that particular case. And so you, you do this in enough places and enough times. And that peanut butter removal really makes a difference. In fact, a lot of the perf improvements that we've seen lead to upgrading from .NET Framework to .NET Core or from .NET Core 3.0 to .NET 6. Some of them are big improvements here and big improvements there, but a lot of it is just this peanut butter that's been removed across the entire surface area, um, as well as then what developers are able to do in their own code by applying an analyzer that replaces all those substrings with as um, Well, it's, you, it's super impactful. You've been very good at dealing with overloads as well. And it, well, strings are the, one of the biggest violators of memory um, in C Sharp. Uh, and I've talked about this in the channel, but you know, the, the, this, it's this reference type which acts as a value type, but then in some scenarios it can be interned in the intern pool, and then you check the reference. But if you want a substring, usually you allocate a new, like you said, a new string and so on, and that has to be garbage collected, pausing the world and everything. Um, you've been really good at adding overloads, mostly of read-only uh, span of character in existing things. So even in code that people might already have, you've just went ahead and now you might not even know it, but you might be using read-only span of that overload, um, making not only the framework faster, but our own code faster. And what I'm wondering is, have you reached the limit of where span can be applied in .NET? Or because we've seen these huge performance boosts every year, .NET is so much faster, so much faster. At some point, surely, you can't keep it up. I, probably at some point, but it's nowhere in sight. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've had this comment on the previous post that I've done. Um, someone quoted the, I think I even mentioned this in the .NET 7 post, like someone had quoted in my, in a comment on my .NET 6 post that quoted the Die Hard uh, movie quote, which is quoting someone else, or paraphrasing someone else, you know, um, Alexander surveyed his domain and was saddened that he realized he had nothing left to conquer, right? And someone was asking, like, does, does that apply to this as well? And in some of my earlier posts, like, I was worried, wow, we did so much stuff, how could we possibly do more? And then the next release, I sit down to write the post, and I'm like, wow, we did more. <laughs> you know, there is a never-ending supply of improvement potential. Um, some of it comes from um, we just found better ways to do something. You know, there was that we, some of it comes from um, other changes got made elsewhere. The JIT was able to optimize X, so we were then able to do Y, which we couldn't do before. Um, and then that feeds into itself. Because we're able to do Y, we want to do Z, but we can't unless the JIT also optimizes blah. So then the JIT goes and optimizes blah, and then that opens up this whole other world. Um, and from the you know co uh, uh, code generation perspective, there's always that next optimization that can possibly be done, excuse me, to eke out a little bit more perf. Sometimes it comes from areas that we haven't paid a whole lot of attention to, you know, um, uh, in, in some of the more modern workloads we've focused on optimizing uh, or benchmarks we focused on optimizing. They're JSON-based and they're all these, you know, newfangled words. But then it turns out a lot of people are still using XML and yet we haven't paid much attention to our XML libraries. And so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to go and fix there. So we go through and, you know, fix that. Sometimes it's, we just haven't heard about something being a bottleneck until someone points it out. And then we look at it and go, oh, wow, like, yeah, we could improve that. Just yesterday, I was having a conversation with someone um, where they pointed out that their bench, their their profiling was showing that they were spending a whole lot of time doing um, date time parsing. 
Uh, and in particular, they were doing date time parsing with the, the R format, which is RFC 1123 or whatever. Um, and that surprised me because we have optimized that when we got it. We previously, in previous releases, had dropped it down from taking something like uh, a you know a thousand nanoseconds to like thirty nanoseconds uh, on .NET Core, but in their benchmark on .NET Seven, it was showing up as taking um, like a thousand nanoseconds or something. So I was like, oh, that's weird. So we go and look at it, and it turns out that one argument that they had passed to their call knocked us off that fast path. So we ended up going from the 30 nanosecond fast path to the thousand nanosecond right. slow path. I'm like, this really shouldn't even be taking a thousand nanoseconds. Like, why is it taking that even when you get knocked off? And I realized we're spending two thirds of the time comparing day and month names based on the current culture with this linguistic comparison calling out to either ICU or NLS, depending on what system they're on. But they were passing in variant culture, which most people do when you're doing date time parsing. So we can add a special case for invariant culture. And I checked that in yesterday and it shaved two thirds off the cost of that thousand nanoseconds. So that dropped, even if you get knocked off the 30 nanosecond slow path, now you're on the 300 nanosecond path instead of the thousand nanosecond path. And if you're doing that for every web request you make or every you know uh, socket request you receive, that adds up. Um, so, and, and I, I just wouldn't have looked at that code if someone hadn't brought it to my attention. But when I did, I thought, wow, there's a, a treasure trove here. If we want to go and spend more time, I did the low-hanging fruit. There's still more that can and probably will at some point be done. Um, and I think we also see that we end up spending, you know, we're constantly sort of taking care of the 80% cases. And once all those 80% cases go away, what was the 20% case is now the 100% case. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, Tip away the eighty percent of that, and it's just this constant flywheel. Do you go as far as I don't know something like the if you're in the web and like you said socket domain, if something is represented as a string, but you expect it to start with something like HTTPS uh, semicolon and then uh, forward slash forward slash, just detect that and treat it differently so you can optimize. Yeah. Um, so, for example, in our uh, in our HTTP client parser inside Socket's HTTP handler, where it's doing HTTP one one parsing, right? We have certain known strings uh, that we expect to uh, see, or in the in the formatter part of it, send certain things that we know as a unit. We're just going to always have to blit to the wire. So we have a read only span of byte you know, UTF-8 encoded, which is made yeah. really easy with U8 in C Sharp 11 um, for HTTP, you know, space or HTTP slash 1.1. Um, and as part of all of our um, headers, we have the pre-encoded UTF-8 version of that header. Even though, you know, the we're, we're matching it based on the UTF-16 string, we have the pre-computed U8 bytes, um, which we can then just blit to the wire. Yeah. Or if we're parsing the TLS header, you know, we know it's only going to be one of these four things. And so we have, you know, an optimized path for detecting those four things. We fall off a cliff, it's if it's anything else, but it's never anything else. Yeah. And if it is, it's either an error or it's the 0.0001% case, which we don't, not that we don't care about, but we don't care about. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. How much one of the most common comments I get again when I'm talking about features like this, mainly related to performance, is oh, I'd expect the compiler to do that for me. I can't believe I have to do this. Why is the compiler in C sharp so dumb? Mm. And sometimes they think they, they think they talk about the compiler, but they talk about the JIT. Sometimes they do talk about the compiler. What do you have to say about that? So for the most part, the C sharp compiler hasn't been in the generalized optimization game, right? It it does optimize certain things and spends a lot of time optimizing certain things, but it doesn't do a ton of optimization focused code transformations generally over your code. For the most part, it leaves that up to the backend compiler, the JIT or native AOT or whatever. Um, however, 
there are times when it does spend a significant amount of effort doing these kinds of transformations. Typically, it's when um, you've expressed something in sort of this higher level construct that C-sharp provides, and it is flexible in terms of how it lowers it, because it's not detailed as part of the specification. It, you know, if you call foo, well, C-sharp compiler is going to dutifully say you called foo, right? But if you write a switch statement for over a string and have a bunch of cases, it has a lot of flexibility in terms of how it implements that switch statement because it effectively has to choose some implementation strategy and it can optimize what that was. In fact, uh, a few weeks ago, a change got checked in that significantly improved how C Sharp lowers switch statements, um, in particular for strings. Yeah. And we are seeing more of that. We are seeing more places where the C Sharp compiler gets in on the implementation game. There are also places where C sharp features are implemented specifically to help with uh, performance. Um, so, you know, in C sharp 10 and .NET 6, we basically overhauled how C sharp is able to handle interpolated strings. Uh, it completely changed its emit strategy for that based on new types that we exposed in the runtime, and also made it a generalized pattern that allowed you to, uh, with good efficiency, target things other than strings, be able to interpolate into a string builder, be able to write directly to a span. And that's thanks to work that was done in C Sharp. You could do that with just library calls, but it's not nearly as, as nice and clean. Or other features being considered. You mentioned um, you know, just upgrading and having, um, just by recompiling, you get benefits because of span-based overloads. So one of the things that's being, uh, hopefully is gonna happen in C-sharp 12 is uh, being able to put params, not just in front of arrays, but also in front of spans. Um, and the way that that is currently planned to be done, uh, param span will take precedent over params array. So if there's a place where we currently have a params array, if we add an overload that is params span and you recompile, the compiler will end up prefer, well, hopefully, if it all goes to plan, will end up preferring the params span based overload, thereby uh, most of the time eliminating the allocation that would have occurred for that, for that params array. Um, and this is all thanks to work that happens at the, the C sharp level. So is there more opportunity for doing more optimization at the C sharp level? Surely in certain areas. In other more uh, generalized areas, yes, but it's, it comes with trade offs and it's a little bit iffy. So, for example, we've talked about for a long time now um, changing how C sharp is allowed to lower for each loops. Right? So, you can for each over an array or a span, and the C-sharp compiler will lower that to a, effectively the equivalent of a for loop for i equals zero, i is less than span dot length i plus plus, and then indexing into the span. It's very nice. But you for each over a list of t, um, and it falls back to binding to its enumerator pattern. Now, thankfully, list of t does have an enumerator struct, so it doesn't incur an allocation. But if it were an i enumerable rather than a list of t, it'll end up allocating an enumerable, an enumerator rather, uh, to do the iteration. What if the compiler saw statically typed that the thing you were for reaching was an I list? Could it instead rewrite that to a for loop? Yes, but it would come at some potential benefit loss depending on your perspective. So for example, if I for each a list of T and while I'm for reaching it, I change it thereby totally invalidating the enumeration, probably leading to bugs, um, continuing to for each it will result in an exception, saying like, you just changed this, uh, you can't do that. Whereas if it lowered it to a four i equals zero i is less than list dot length, there would be no such exception because there'd be nothing to hook and nothing tracking it. And so just doing that automatic lowering basically no longer preserves the invariance that the developer expected, the contract that they were promised. Certain changes the compiler could make could break those promises. And so thus, historically, we've really shied away from doing those kinds of transformations because the code, developer's code no longer is predictable. Um, and we've made it a very explicit act. We're considering things like that via some opt-in mechanism whether local or project global or whatever, um, but they are taken extremely seriously. Anything that could possibly change the semantics of, of your code. 
Well, what I found interesting is that if I try to <clears throat> to have a for loop on a reference type, just normal for loop, and um, I iterate over that in a collection around the hundred items, let's say, and then with the exact same array that I'm, did I say list? I thought I meant array. If I take that array and I say as span, or just I just turn this into a, uh, a span of the same type, it is just instantly twice as fast on average on that collection size. Now that doesn't scale with a hundred thousand or a million items, but in some of the tests I've done, that's the numbers I'm observing, like forty-five milliseconds through, sorry, nanoseconds to twenty-five. Why wouldn't the default behavior be? Treat it as a span. Is it because it can lead into bugs? It's because, because we think it can change the semantics. So, for example, yeah. you know, you, uh, and, you know, if if that were done, then writing into the list while you were enumerating would no longer produce an exception. Um, yeah. And that's that's the fundamental reason why those kinds of changes haven't been made. Now, mm -hmm. if we were to eliminate those version checks, yeah. we might reconsider those. What I find interesting is that you're you're walking a very thin line with your approaches, which is, you know, you acknowledge that fact that it is technically unsafe to do this. But the collections marshal, I think that's the name, class is public, it's not internal. So anyone can use that and get this the backing array of a list and use a span on that and not yep. get an exception if they But that is their choice. They're opting in to do it. We don't want to prevent anyone from doing things as fast as they possibly want to. We want to make it possible for things, people to do things as fast as they want to. But when there is any aspect of unsafety associated with it, we want it to be opt-in. So if you want to for each over your, your list of T as a span, here is the tool to do it. Have at it. This is what you're giving up. Uh, and that's a choice that someone mix. Pretty much everything that we do, if you see anything under system runtime interop services, whether or or system runtime compiler services, or if it has the word martial or unsafe in it, that is sort of our indication of you are stepping outside the guardrails. You now need to understand with more purpose what it is that you're doing. And we bless you, go have fun, but it's on you if you make a mistake. Um, and so, you know, and that's why the things on collection Marshall aren't extension methods there because we don't want it to be hidden in the source code. We want it to be very explicit. Interestingly enough, the class named unsafe is not unsafe. Well, it is unsafe, but it does not require you to enable unsafe compilation, which with, for many people would be a showstopper. And be like, okay, I'm going into something that will really mess up my code if I'm not careful. But unsafe doesn't have that. Even well, though it's technically unsafe. So there have been, since .NET Framework 1.0, there have been things that are just as unsafe uh, without requiring the unsafe keyword. Marshall.read, Marshall.write. You give it an arbitrary int pointer, which is totally safe, uh, and you can read and write anywhere in memory. And like, you know, joke's on you if you do. Um, so that's why I say it's anything that's martial or unsafe or runtime interop services, you can p-invoke in safe code, right? Yeah. Fair. And totally mess up your program. Fair. Right? So there, there is this, I'm stepping outside of the guardrails. We want you to do it. We allow you to do it. But the whole idea that you are safe unless you've marked your program as allow unsafe blocks is, is a joke to me. Yes, it, it, it's it's a scale. It's not like yes or no, right? It's you're limiting your attack surface area. If you don't spend, if you if you allow unsafe blocks, then yes, you can you can do more things in more places that maybe someone won't notice. But it doesn't fundamentally make your project safe to unsafe because there's all this functionality that you can use whether or not that is set, and that's been true even in .NET Framework 1.0. Have there been any, have you put any thought into it? Because I know there's a discussion about adding an attribute along the lines, I can't remember exactly the name, but require and save code or something on those things. Yeah, basically, can we make the unsafe keyword viral is the description. Right. 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 So that um, today, you know, today, if you put unsafe in the signature of your method, 
you're not actually that's not part of the signature it's just a convenient place to put it that is an implementation detail for the method very much like async you put async in your signature it doesn't mean anything for consumers of the method it's really a statement of implementation detail of the method so there's talk about well could we change the meaning of the unsafe keyword such that if you had it in your method signature that actually impacts consumers it means your consumers it treat it like a pointer so that it could only be used in an unsafe block um, uh, or if we don't want to take that breaking change a new attribute that is requires unsafe as you said where an analyzer or the compiler or whatever would flag it and say no you could only use this inside of a an unsafe block that would allow you to give a little bit more meaning to that compiler flag which has only been about c sharp's notion of language syntax that is considered unsafe pointers basically yeah. but even then there are lots of gray areas like would we mark a ray pool as unsafe you're not reading and writing memory but you can totally overwrite somebody else's data if you return an array and keep writing to it. So is that unsafe? It's, <laughs> you have to draw the line somewhere. And yeah. I think it would probably be before that point. Yeah. So so then my question is, at what point do we say, you know, well, screw it. Unsafe is not really something we care about. Anything is game. I mean, it, I have this conversation with a, a bunch of developers, uh, not infrequently but like well i'm not allowed to use unsafe at my company so how can i do x and i, I found this marshall thing like i'm going to use that i'm like well it you're, you're working around your your guidelines you're no more safe than you were yesterday um it i get the position it, 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 if you look at it from on a spectrum if you look at it as I'm trying to defense in depth. I'm trying to reduce my exposure. I want to reduce the likelihood that some developer in my company who doesn't really understand what they're doing is going to go and introduce a subtle vulnerability. It's a lot easier to start typing out pointers than it is to reach for system runtime interop services dot marshall dot read with an int pointer and blah. So on that spectrum, like having a rule that is we don't allow unsafe blocks is fine. As long as you really understand that it's not actually decreasing the possibility of uh, having any unsafe vulnerabilities in your code base, just reducing the likelihood that they would creep in. And if that's your mentality, great. Um, and adding such a viral mechanism, uh, if that's your mentality, you know, great. Uh, it's about reducing the, the, the vulnerable surface area, making things more visible, but not about a yes or no, is it possible or is it not? Right. If you could, in hindsight, remove one of the features that are unsafe and mark it as safe in the same way that the unsafe class is not really marked as unsafe and so on, uh, what would it be? What would that be? Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Can you so, 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 so currently, you know, pointers, if you want to use them, you have to use the unsafe keyword and then enable unsafe compilation. If you could remove something from that safeguard that you have to enable unsafe and treat it as safe, but not really safe. It's up to the user to use it right in the same way that the, or the Marshall methods or the unsafe class stuff <clears throat> are uh, technically can be unsafe, but you can use them in a safe context. What would that be? So I'm not sure there's anything. I mean, so all of my projects, like I set that flag just out of habit. So as, I, as I, enabled. Allow unsafe blocks. Allow unsafe. For, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because I personally know that if I if I want to use a pointer, I'm going to use a pointer, right? If I yeah. want to make an interop call, I'm going to make an interop call. I don't want that extra thing blocking me. So for me personally, there's nothing that falls into the, that camp. If I want to use unsafe, I just put unsafe on the class, and I never long, no longer have to think about it. But I'll change your question slightly. There are certain things that you couldn't do even in unsafe that I have wanted to do. Oh, if the compiler blocked you. And now in C sharp 11, it will no longer block you. There are errors that are now turned into warnings inside of an unsafe block, um, which you still get the compiler still telling you, be careful. There are dragons here. Uh, you better really know what you're doing, but 
it makes it, this is again in that same theme of warn but make it possible right yeah uh you you have to opt into it but we're not going to block you so for example um you know uh, let's take a typical pattern um you have a you know there's the string.create function that we added back in .NET Core 2.1 i think right that allows you to yeah. create a string you tell it how long it is and it gives you a callback with a span that you fill in right that allows you to pass uh an argument into that any any t you want can also be passed into the callbacks you don't have to have a closure and you can pass in whatever state you need to appropriately populate that span but it's a t right it, it can't be a span because a span can't be a generic so if you had your input data that you wanted to actually feed into that string creation and it was a span you have to do this dance where you basically pin the span get the pointer cast the pointer to an int pointer, pass the int pointer and length into the as the T, and then inside the callback, um, create a new span from the pointer and the length, and then you've got your input data and your output span, and you, you go to 10. What you might want to do is, well, I've got my local input span here that was passed in as an argument. Can't I just take the address of that local and just pass that address directly into the span, Don't into the string.create? I want to pin anything. I don't want to fact extract a pointer and a length and pass in a tuple of those and then reconstruct the span. I just want to take the address of the span here, pass the address in, and you know, uh, dereference that address to get back to my original span. You couldn't previously do that because the compiler would warn you, you're taking the address of a managed type. Uh, no, no. Right. And, in, and, and that's still the case today. If you try and take the address of a span, you can't do that unless you're inside of an unsafe block. If you're inside of an unsafe block, that error is reduced to a warning, which you can suppress. Right. And so now if you look in runtime, places that we were doing that, um, we're now able to do the thing we wanted to do, uh, whereas previously we weren't. And this shows up in a variety of places, like um, you have a generic T, and we, we know that that T is something that, um, you know, we, we do a type check. We, we know that type of T equals type of int. So we want to, um, you know, uh, cast the 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 value through uh, an int pointer and then dereference it to get an int. But I can't take the address of the T because it's a managed type. So, yeah. but now in unsafe code, I can suppress that and I can write the code that I wanted to write. Um, so there are things like that where we're finding places where we have totally blocked you from doing something and made it possible, not places where we made it possible with unsafe and we're making it possible without unsafe. Although, back to our previous conversation of span, a lot of what we've done to span is take something that you previously had to drop down to unsafe code for to get the performance you wanted and allow you to do it just with spans and still get the same performance, but with all the safety benefits. I see. Yeah, that's that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. I wanted... I completely forgot to ask that when you mentioned it, but I actually, you said something previously that was very interesting. You mentioned when we're talking about optimizations in the compiler, um, optimizing a switch on a string. So previously, if I remember correctly, if you have a switch on a string, it's converted, it's lowered into if else, if the length of the items in the switch are less than a number. And then after that, there's effectively a tree built behind the scenes based on hashes of those strings and ranges. What is the improvement now? How how did that change? So um, if so, previously, like you said, if there were I think it's six or fewer cases, um, it would just do if string dot equals blah then that else if string dot equals blah then that. Beyond that, it would hash uh, it would hash all of the cases getting a hash code for each. And then it would basically do, a, it would order them to do a binary search. So it basically, if you imagine sorting the hash code values and then having an if block on the middle value and then within that, you know, so it does this uh, binary search through them. So you get through the cases and log in. Um, now, however, in C Sharp, well, whatever the next C Sharp compiler is that has it, um, it still does both of those things. But it has an additional capability, which is it looks over all the cases and it um, it buckets them by length. So if you had uh, a case that was 
only one a string of length one and a case that was a string of length two and a case that was a string of length three and then another with uh, a string of length three and so on you're going to end up with a bucket for length one a bucket for length two a bucket for length three that has two things in it and so on and so as long as um those are reasonably dense and the number of items in each bucket is reasonably small the compiler will actually emit it now as a switch over the length and then for a bucket that contains just one thing at that point for that length all it has to do is compare against that one known case um, and with reasonably dense cases that jump is a very simple jump table right so it very quickly looks the length jumps to the right spot if um it also knows at that point the max and the min length so it knows it doesn't have to jump anywhere if it was the, the input you're getting is you know more or less than that or it can jump to the default if there is a default um and so as long as i don't remember exactly what number um J julian is the dev on the c-sharp team who worked on it he picked some number maybe it's like four strings per bucket or something um it will um uh you know just do a search through them if there are more than that inside each bucket it goes an extra step which is all right let's say i have 20 strings in the same length bucket but at position five let's say this is the bucket for length 10 but at position five um every one of my strings has a different character now i can just do a switch over string sub five with a case for each of those unique character values and then just compare against that one string so we you know, we basically reduce it down to a jump by length or a jump by character and we're done and there are various heuristics within there about you know how many in allowed in each bucket how much duplication do you allow at a given position <laughs> and so on but you can imagine how for certain switch statements this would end up in a significantly reduced overhead yeah no hashing nothing damn have you do you have numbers on performance improvement on that or yeah but not off the top of my head okay uh, that's, but that's for, fine but for certain case statements for certain switch statements they are uh substantial okay now well when I say substantial like you know we're talking about nanoseconds yeah but but order of magnitude change from before to after and if that's something you're doing on a very frequent basis that's a big deal damn well that's something that goes into my backlog of videos because <laughs> I had one, which is, I think the title would be what's hiding behind the switch statement in C sharp. And now I have to pause it because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. You can find, um, he, he has some, you know, he's got a bunch of, uh, Julian had a bunch of, um, you can find the PR or I can dig yeah. it up for you, but it's got a bunch of information in it about the algorithm that's used. And... Awesome. That's going to be a really interesting read. I'm sure I'll read about it in, in your next blog as well. <laughs> you will. Uh, it'll definitely be there. And it, it actually, um, it's part of sort of a trend that we've been seeing. Like, I know you did um, a previous video on the Frozen collections that we're adding to Dunnet 8. Um, and they're very logically related. Um, and this is a trend that we've been doing more and more, which is we've got something which is reasonably fast, but we want to make, be able to make it faster. So we allow you to do something at runtime that pre-computes at runtime a whole bunch of information to allow uh, making that operation significantly faster. So you pay for the costs of going from uh, the normal lookups to you know the the super optimized thing. But then we also do something at compile time where if you know everything statically, we can pre-compute all of that stuff statically. So if you imagine the switch statement is basically the innards of a dictionary. Yeah. Right? So the switch statement optimization, if you know all your cases, you know all your key value pairs basically at compile time, the switch statement provides those optimizations. If you don't care or don't know, you've got the normal dictionary. And if you care and, and, and you don't know, you've got frozen dictionary. Um, and that spectrum shows up in a bunch of places, like regex. You saw in .NET 7, right? So there's regex, which you get reasonable perf. There's regex.compiled, uh, regex options.compiled, where at runtime, if you want to optimize it, you pay 
a non-trivial amount of extra cost to go to the compiled version. But if you know it all at compile time, use the source generator and all that pre-computation happens at compile time. And this pattern shows up in other cases as well. For example, um, string interpolation, right? If you know your string format, if you've got string dot format, right? that's in the middle, I've had that for a long time, where it's reasonably fast, we can make the implementation a little bit faster every release, but you're basically pre you're reparsing the format string every time you call string dot format. Um, well, if you know it at compile time, you can use an interpolated string and all that parsing happens at compile time. But what if you don't know it at compile time? Well, we in .NET 8, we've added this composite format type, which pre-parses the format string. You make the exact same string dot format call, but, but rather than parsing in the string, you, parse in, you pass in the composite format pre-parsed object. And we save that overhead on every call. See so this, this spectrum of everything at compile time, no optimizations, optimizations at runtime keeps repeating itself in a bunch of different places. I, I saw this, I don't know if it was there when I originally did the video on frozen collections, but I saw a flag now when you do two frozen dictionary, I think, which is optimized for reads. Yeah. Which in my head, I thought, well, it's a frozen dictionary. What else would you optimize for? So I haven't looked into what that is, but what's the logic behind that? And yeah. if you're abstracting for something that is frozen, which is read optimized, like, is it a leaky abstract? Should I know to, why would I optimize for reads, you know? Right. So I wouldn't be surprised if the shape of that changes prior to our actually shipping okay. um, in one way, shape or form, but we've got months before that needs to be locked down. However, the the problem we face is frozen dictionary and frozen set serve two logical purposes. Um, one is I just want a surface area that prevents me from making mistakes, right? I want a surface area that is immutable, that doesn't add confusing add or remove methods, um, where if I, uh, that is reasonably fast, you know, at least as fast as dictionary or hash set for lookups. And if I were to return one of these as an I read only dictionary or an I read only set, I don't have to worry about the consumer casting it back to a dictionary or a hash set and mutating it, right? Today, if uh, I have to make that choice, right? Either if I really want something to be, uh, I want to prevent the consumer from mutating, I like wrap my dictionary in a read only dictionary, uh, and then I return that out. We don't actually have a concrete read-only set, but you could imagine us having one. Um, uh, so we we could do that. Um, but then you're constructing this extra layer of, of wrapper, and you're not getting a whole lot for it. Um, with a frozen dictionary, if I just want to create one and have the basic performance of a dictionary, but still I can still be sure that no one will mutate it. I can hand that out as a read-only dictionary. And if someone casts it back, there's nothing they can do. And it's still way faster than an immutable dictionary, which has order log n lookup performance. Um, we've also seen places where people, and because of that, we've seen a lot of interest in the frozen dictionary surface area for things that aren't about create it once and use it for the lifetime of your process. Right, it's I have a an object model that I'm exposing in my UI in my UI types, and I want to use a frozen dictionary because I want to ensure that this thing isn't mutated. But I still want the general performance of a dictionary. But I'm going to be creating these things a, a, a lot, so I don't want to spend a ton of time each time I create them trying to optimize for optimal throughput. Because if we spend a second optimizing the construction, it would take hundreds and hundreds of thousands of thousands of I get value calls to make up that differential. Um, but there is then the second level of, well, I, I do care about the immutability of it, but I care about it because I'm going to be creating this thing once and I'm going to be using it forever and I want to totally optimize the heck out of this. And I don't care if it takes a second to construct this thing because I'm going to be making a billion calls on this over the lifetime. And so I do want those, those calls optimized. So we're trying to straddle these two worlds. Are you actually using it for long lived? You're willing to spend more time at startup use? Or are you using it purely for the surface area and the guarantees, but you're going to be creating them at some non-trivial frequency? 
And so the Boolean is basically starting in a safe place from a performance perspective. You get the, the perf of dictionary, the perf of hash set with the immutable, purely immutable surface area. And you opt into saying, actually, dear constructor or dear factory, please take as much time as you feel you need to give me the best possible subsequent throughput on reads. And I assume, I haven't actually watched the stats portion of your video on frozen collections, but I assume you did some perf benchmarks as you normally do and saw that it might be 10,000 times as long or 100,000 times as long to construct one of these, which means it requires a whole lot of try-get value calls to make up that difference. If you've got a long-lived service, you're going to make that up in no time and it's totally worth it. Yeah. But that's not always the use case. Yeah. And so try to make it fall into a pit of success and then opt into additional success. Now, if we could get it to the point where we could come up with different algorithms or different optimizations internally in the constructor that would drive the cost down to a reasonable difference, then maybe we would remove the Boolean and just say, yeah, these are a little bit more expensive to construct. But like you can construct insanely costly inputs to these things. And we don't currently have a backstop. We say, thou shalt use trusted input. If you use anything else, it's on you. But you know, I have an input to one of these things that's only a thousand strings and literally takes a minute to construct the dictionary, um, which is not reasonable if you're creating these things a few times a second for you know your UI. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's yeah, the, the explanation. The, the conclusion of that video was very much, holy shit, it's so slow to construct. Yeah. If you have a singleton or something that's going to live for the whole application's lifetime, then use it. It's going to be faster than a normal dictionary. Um, but it is backed by, uh, I mean, the keys and the values are backed by immutable constructs, I think, um, which have to build the trees behind the scenes. And I haven't looked at the whole implementation, but it looks very costly. Um, what I found very interesting is that you did actually mention before that most of the technically unsafe stuff that you can do are not extension methods. But I'm pretty sure I also saw in the frozen dictionary a get value or ref null, or, or I can't remember the exact name. I think there's an extension method on the type which allows you to get a reference to an item and then replace the reference if you want to. So to a degree... You, you can't replace it unless what you did was you used unsafe as ref to turn to cast away the route to cast away the read only this is probably what i did yeah you did yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i i do things like like <laughs> the thing so is it, it, there it wasn't to get value as you know get value ref that was the unsafe thing it was the yeah. unsafe as ref yeah, to yeah, cast yeah. It. you're right you're right you're right yes <laughs> but it's the thing is and that's another thing I really like. You make it very easy if you know what you're doing. To you, because I'm sure you want to use those things as well in .NET. Right. And this comes back to the thing I said earlier: so we want to make it possible, and we don't want to block you from doing it. We just don't want it to be. We don't want the unsafe thing to be the default. Yeah. Right. We want you to opt into the thing and you know go in with eyes full, you know, wide open. If you type unsafe dot as ref, like. You get just right. Yeah, it's it's me. I'm the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I there's there's so many little things like this that I find fascinating on that unsafe aspect. There is no reason why I should care about these small optimizations, but I do find them very interesting. I recently found out that one of the fastest ways to loop around a, an array or a span is to actually get a reference to the first item and then a reference to the last item using the the length of the span and then use unsafe.is address less than and have a while loop and then move the offset by one item and that basically is as fast as you can get in my experience experiments but that's not something you'd want anyone to ever do right it's also it it really I mean, maybe there's like one in, one assembly instruction difference from what the JIT would generate for a for i equals zero, i is less than yeah. and dot length i plus plus. But I mean, if there's a difference, we're probably talking like a one percent yeah. difference or something. Yeah. Um, and using unsafe in that capacity, 
it is so easy to get it wrong. Um, we've all gotten it wrong. I've gotten it wrong. People that are super duper experts in that space have gotten it wrong. Um, and certain kinds of iteration are more susceptible to it. Um, for example, iterating backwards. If you happen to step off the beginning by just a little bit, um, you know, if you're iterating from beginning to end, the, the way the, the JIT and GC work, if you're pointing to, or to the way the GC works, if you're pointing to just after the last element, the GC still considers that to be a reference, a valid reference to that thing. So oh. pointing to just before the first element, that is no, not a valid reference to the thing. So if you iterate backwards and you step off, you now have a GC hole because the GC could move the thing because it no longer considered it to be referenced. So these kinds of unsafe patterns are truly unsafe. And you have to really Right. I didn't know that. Interesting. So if, even though you mentioned actually something that was around interpolated string handlers and, and how that has changed. So actually string interpolation has changed, I think three times in some capacity it used to be string.concat if I remember correctly, or string.format, then in some scenarios it became string.concat. And now it's with C sharp 10 uh, string interpolated handlers are in place to, to replace, um, all the cases. And for what I understand, the biggest issue with how it was before was there was a, a lot of boxing happening because your value types would have to be converted into an object to be concatenated yeah. in the string. There's a variety of costs that were there. So to what you were referring to with string concat. So the, the compiler would lower interpolated strings basically as best as it could. Um, its default, its workhorse was just calling string dot format with the basically the interpolated string, but with numbers replacing, you know, enough for all the holes replacing the values, and then passing each of those arguments as another argument to string dot format. Um, if there was an overload of string dot concat that it could use, um, it would do so. If you happen to have everything be string constants, then it would just lower it to a constant. Yeah. But those were, you know, the kinds of things that it could do. So the string dot concat one is if 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 you had, you know, hello comma hole, and I had, you know, Nick to be filled into that hole, um, you would get a string dot concat of hello comma and string for Nick. And that's that's the best you can do, right? That's uh, super fast. You can't do any better than that, at least in terms of creating a string. But if it was hello integer, right now, uh, it's going to call um, string dot you know, format with hello with zero, and the integer is passed in as the first argument. There are only overloads of string dot format that take objects, so that integer gets boxed. And then as part of the call, string dot format also has to parse that format string. So it has the composite first. So it has to walk, you know, H E L L O comma. Oh, yeah. here's a hole. What should I fill into it? Okay. Now I need to call whatever on it. And, um, and if you had more than three arguments, there's only a string dot format for object argument, explicit arguments for one, two, and three arguments. If you had four arguments, now it's a params object array. So you're allocating an array for that. So you have all these costs associated with this. And we set out to tackle that in C sharp. 10 and .NET 6. So we chain, we added an additional lowering strategy that the compiler could use. We basically said for just normal string interpolation, where you're, you're interpolating into a string, um, we have this default string interpolated handler and the compile it's a struct and the compiler will construct one of those on the stack and it'll pass into the constructor a little bit of information about the number of holes in the composite format string and the number of constant characters to allow some pre-sizing to happen. And then for every constant portion of the string, it just calls add literal. So for the hello name example, yeah. it was, you know, handler dot uh, append literal hello comma, right? So it's, it's already parsed that out. And then uh, handler dot uh, append of string, you know, uh, or actually there's an overload specifically for string, so append string. Yeah. Um, and it's all pre-parsed. And if there was an integer there, it calls append of int. So there's nothing boxed. Um, 
And so all the parsing happens at compile time. If you look at the IL for the decompiled C-sharp from the IL, you see basically it's pre-parsing. You just have this append, 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 append for each of the relevant parts. No boxing, no params array. Um, everything is pre-parsed. And you get this very sort of efficient upfront thing. And then um, C-sharp also added the ability to support custom handlers. So if you're not just targeting string, um, you can write these custom handlers where if you implement the right, expose the right pattern, the compiler will lower string interpolation syntax down to calls to your handler. Um, so uh, we added a string builder dot append and append line methods that take one of these handlers. And so if you were passing interpolated string into that, that actually gets lowered to uh, basically new string builder append handler passing in the string builder as an argument and then append, append, append for each of the, and so you're basically appending directly into the spring, string builder with no boxing, no params arrays, no extra parsing, as if you had written those calls yourself, but you got to write it in the nice interpolated string syntax. Or uh, we have this memory extensions dot try write extension method for span, where you can say span dot try write interpolated string. And uh, it basically creates a new handler that um, writes into the span, updates its position, writes into the span, updates position. So you're basically writing directly into the span. So you could interpolate into stack-based memory or whatever. Yep. Um, we've added overloads of string.create where you can specify a culture, you can specify some um, some stack allocated scratch space that you want to use or a, a buffer that you have that you want to use to basically further optimize the implementation. Um, and because C Sharp added these capabilities, now anywhere we want to do this kind of interpolation, we can go and add these overloads. And it's got some really cool um, use cases for it. So for example, we added the ability to um, conditionally perform those append operations. Um, so the you can the way you can construct these things in a signature, you can use various attributes to tell the compiler to pass in some of the arguments to the handler. Uh, so if you were doing a, a logging method, for example, you might be passing in, you know, your um, a log level, you know, only log this if it's critical. And if you were using interpolated strings before, all that string interpolation would happen before you even made the log call. So you'd have to write your own guard that says if log level critical, blah. But now that log level can be passed into the handler. The handler itself can check and say, oh, this isn't critical. So tells the basically sets a Boolean that the compiler uses to guard all of those append calls, and all that work just gets skipped. And you can see this even in the framework itself, in the core libraries itself, if you were using debug assert, um, debug assert, some condition, and then an interpolated string. Um, well, there's no need for us to do any of the work associated with that interpolated string if the condition is true. And the condition should never be false because if it is, your program is about to crash, right? So um, the, we basically can skip, we, we can use interpolated strings without worrying about the cost of, of or what our debug asserts are adding to our code base. And some people have looked at us like, does it really matter? This is debug code. We actually had a case where, you know, when, when we run debug, like when we run corelib core lib debug, we're getting all of the asserts in corelib, right? And that includes all of the assertions we have in things like floating point formatting. We had a case where some of those asserts were using interpolated strings with floating point, um, and it was adding like minutes wow. to execution time because there was all this assertion happening around uh, all these floating point values, making sure that everything was in the right place and so on. And by switching that on, we, and so we had gone through and replaced the use of interpolated strings with manual guard clauses uh, or the use of debug assert with, you know, if not conditioned, then call debug.fail rather than using debug assert. And when we rolled out this interpolated string handler for debug assert, we were able to then go and reverse, revert all of those edits and just go back to debug assert. Um, and so there's just an, you know, an infinite number of possibilities for what you can do with these handlers. It's one of my favorite features of C-sharp 10. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I've made, I think three videos showcasing basically everything you mentioned. Um, one of the biggest things, obviously, if you're using the source generated logging providers, all that is baked in for you, you don't have to worry about anything. Um, and one of the biggest problems used to be that you have to check the log level so you don't make the call because the, those log information methods and so on were boxing as well. Uh, 
but one of my favorite things is that now you can create your own log logger specific string interpolated handler and when you're doing structured logging you have to pass a name that is then mapped into a json object or whatever now you can make your own logger capture the name of the variable using the caller um attribute caller expression attribute write an analyzer that only allows you to pass a single value uh, with a single name in the interpolated handler and then have a compiler error if you mess it up if you don't mess it up just capture it and push it into your logs it really changed the game the only concern i have which is not really a concern it's just a you couldn't really have done it differently is how janky it feels to write one of those uh handlers because yeah. it's attribute based and then method name based it's the the same uh duck typing that we're sort of used to because of if you want to have it as a struct you can't really do anything else about it so yeah. yeah i mean they're not they're not super trivial to write um but the the hope is that you know in terms of the magnitude of the number of people consuming them there's this many being written yeah. and it's not hard to do it just requires some kind of you know mental gymnastics to understand exactly when and how the information is flowing yeah once you understand and actually i i was doing a talk about minimal apis the past year now my my next talk is about logging and string interpolated handlers have one part in that the idea that you can have booleans and then have checks and conditional logic on all of that like uh Seth's case it's fantastic um and i know most people will never have to worry about that but those who do you know, strings are one of the biggest violators in memory um so anything we can do to to fix that uh you know the, the better yeah um what what else or, or actually i've seen this type in dotnet called string segment and there's also an array segment were those attempts to have a similar span experience before span could be a thing that's exactly what they were okay i thought so yeah so array segment is you know has been around since i don't know dotnet framework 2.0 or something yeah. it's trying to represent that that tuple of array offset and count in a single type that you could pass around um if if we were if someone asked us to introduce that today we would say no um the only advantage it provides on top of span is um that you can put it on the heap whereas you can't put span on the heap but you can put right. a memory memory of t or readable memory on the heap so yeah um that we, we wouldn't introduce it today and similarly for string segment that lives in microsoft extensions it was something that was born out of a necessity in asp.net um and um that's also years old and if it was you know if we were doing it today it wouldn't exist i see yeah interesting that i really haven't seen many people talk about it i think i accidentally stumbled across uh, the array segment side of things and i'm like oh wait a sec that w that's exactly how span works what the hell yeah it, you know there are there are apis today that work in terms of it some stuff in networking that involves array segments um memory stream has a get buffer api that returns out its internal array position and length as an array segment but you know that was introduced a decade and a half or something ago two decades ago um uh if we were doing it today that would have been a spam um or, or a memory read only memory yeah i see what do you think or have to say about those saying that if i have to know about all these things the performance related things in c sharp then shouldn't i just go write like c or rust or something else you don't the, there's a built-in assumption there uh, you said if i have to know yeah um and you don't yeah. uh and that's that's really the answer is the vast majority of developers we don't want them to have to know about these things you get very good performance out of the box um i'm not really sure what the box is anymore but uh <laughs> you know, right out of the gate you get yeah. uh, very good performance it's if you've got these you know you you're trying to elevate your game you're trying to go beyond what you get by default there are and you profile and you find bottlenecks 
or if you're looking to sort of trim some fat and you want to make things just generally faster, you're currently using 10 servers, you know, you scaled up to 10 servers and you want to scale, be able to scale down to eight, right? You know, you want to pay a little bit less money and you want to invest in improving things beyond what you get by default. There are additional tools at your disposal. And that's true pretty much any language and pretty much any framework. There's only so far that you get uh, with you know these zero cost abstractions and the things that you use by default and anything beyond that, every environment people are releasing crates or packages or modules or whatever that's oh you're doing this particular operation and you want it to be even faster here's what you should do here's the thing that you should consume right and we've been focusing a lot of effort on making the thing that you get just by writing the natural code we want that to be as fast as possible. And then if you want to go beyond that and you're blocked because of A, B, and C, we want to release tools that help you avoid A, B, and C. And in the next release, we want to push the boundaries such that things where you previously had to use A, B, C, you no longer do because you just kind of get that for free. But now there's a D, E, and F yep. where you want to push it even further. And so we allow the other tools, tools for that. Um, and you know, every time we release those new tools to do the other thing, we also, wherever possible, and this is something that I really try and instill across the team, and you'll see me asking on all the PRs that I review for new features, is where are we ourselves using this? You know, we're adding this new API, where are we consuming it ourselves? And I ask that for two primary reasons. One is just, we just added this feature, we want to vet its use. We've got millions of lines of code across the various .NET repos, um, surely there are places that we should be using it. And if we can't, why not? Does that mean we got the, does that mean we truly don't have a use case for this thing because it is so niche and esoteric or really higher level or whatever? Or is it because there's some flaw in the design? And if we were to fix that flaw, we ourselves could use it too? Because if that's the case, there's a really good chance other people are gonna hit it as well. And the other is if we've done all this work to make this super fast thing. And we have places that we could benefit from that super fastness internally. We want to do that. And that's a lot of where these, you know, when you upgrade from .NET 6 to 7 or 7 to 8, and you see 5, 10, 15% improvements, whatever it is, a lot of it is because we added these features and then we use those features elsewhere. So for example, um, uh, one of the things that we've, we were talking about vectorization earlier. Um, and we've been investing a lot in this in, in the, the core primitives. And now that we have the core primitives in places, where can we use them? And so we've done a lot of work in past releases to optimize things like um, index of and index of any. But if you look at index of any, for example, it's super optimized for searching for one thing, two things, three things. Um, it's not as obvious in the surface area, but four things and five things as well. But the moment you go to six things, you fall off a cliff. So the one, two, three, four, and five things today in .NET 7 are totally vectorized. They all share the same general structure. And then the kernel of the operation is, are you doing one comparison, two comparisons, three comparisons, four or five? But once you hit six things, we no longer vectorize. So today we, um, we walk character by character and we actually build up, um, it's called a probabilistic map. It's basically a bloom filter. Um, so we take all the characters that you gave us we create a two. We create a basically a, a bitmap, a 256 bitmap, and we map all the characters that you gave us into one or two of those bits. So if you gave us a character that was less than 256, we just set that bit. If you gave it that was more than 256 bits, uh, 256, we'll set a bit for the lower byte and a bit for the upper byte, and that allows us to then walk character by character and for each character say, is the character is the bit for this character or the two bits for this character set? If none of the bits are set then we know that that character is one we can ignore and we move on. And so we turn the lookup for each character if it is unlikely to match into just a very quick bitmap lookup. If it does match, we still have to do the full lookup on the initial set. So there are plenty of places where you want to search for more than um, five things. And uh, oftentimes people will either be falling back to this probabilistic map implementation, or they'll have their own custom scheme to try and optimize that further based on their domain. And this happens all over the place. Um, so in .NET 8, we've done 
three things well in this particular area first is we have uh if we haven't already checked it in there's a pr that is literally today about to be checked and that does vectorize that probabilistic map so we're able to compare you know eight characters at a time instead of one character against that map um now this still requires some pre-computation because when you call index of any we still have to generate that map from the characters that you gave us every single time you call index of any um the second thing we've done is we've implemented additional vectorized algorithms that allow us to use the probabilistic map less. So if everything you give us is an ASCII character, which is a very common case, we can actually do a vectorized search now for any number of the 128 ASCII characters in the same amount of time in a vectorized fashion. Doesn't matter whether you give us 10 or 40, we can do the search in the same amount of time. So index of many will now will use either that one of those two approaches will vectorize the ASCII search or to vectorize the probabilistic map. But both of them still require this ramp up. Um, and so we only do it if we think it's going to be beneficial, if the input you're giving us the search is sufficiently long. Um, and these are things where if when you upgrade from .NET to 7 to .NET 8, you just get it, right? You, some of your index of any calls will just start being faster. Yeah. But there's still that warm up cost. So we've added this excuse me, this public type, which is currently called index of any values, um, but uh, it might be renamed. Uh, you call, you, so let's say you had your, your 40 characters that you were searching for. Uh, rather than having a static read-only char array of those 40 values, now you have a static read-only index of any values, initialized index of any values dot create with your 40 characters. And now the index of call, you're not passing in the array, you're passing in that instance. And that instance contains all of the pre-computed vectorization tables or probabilistic map so that we can hit the ground running immediately uh, uh, and get the fully vectorized implementation. And getting back to the very beginning of this discussion, um, we now use that, I think, in like 60 different places across the core lib and system.net.http and ASP.NET because there are all these places where previously we had no way to do it. And so the implementations were either doing it slowly or, well, they were doing it slowly, basically. We, if they just upgraded to use index of any, or they were already doing it, now it's going to be faster. But now if they get the, they do the one line change to separate out into the index of any values. Um, and now just by switching those 60 places over to use it ourselves, anyone who is using those APIs is now, you know, that much faster. So header processing and system that HTTP or an ASP.NET now, you know, uses this, for example. Um, and so all that work feeds back into these APIs, places someone was previously having to know about those additional tools in their toolbox, no longer have to. And then we roll these into other things as well. So for example, the moment we added this index of any value support, we also updated the regex source generator such that uh, it now generates code that uses index of any values. So that the regex source generator, things where it was having to manually walk certain regions of the span before, now it can do so in a vectorized fashion. Um, and that's an example, you don't even have to change your code, you just recompile on .NET 8 and the source generator kicks in, generates, oh, I see that's available, now you're gonna use it. How do you go about choosing where to do these optimizations? Do you just have a ton of c -sharp public code scanned? Because obviously Microsoft has GitHub, I don't know how you can do it without owning the platform, but how do you know what, what, what the, the hot path, the most used features of the low hanging fruit are and you go about optimizing it? Because I'm, I'm assuming you wanna, ha you wanna affect as many people as possible with those changes. So there's, um, I would say three primary ways. One is we just know from past experience what hotspots are. We've tried to optimize them as much as we possibly could. Now we can optimize them better. And those are all burned into our psyches and we're look we're building these features because we know about those hot spots and we want to go address them. So that's a prime example. Another example of that is someone submitted uh, one of our wonderful uh, external you know community developers. Excuse me, submitted a PR to ASP.NET to vectorize a certain bit of processing, and like really appreciate it. But it was adding like 200 lines of this low level code to ASP.NET, and my response was, "Thank you so much for doing this." Let's not do it. Yeah. We're going to land this feature over here. 
help us make it exactly what we need. And so we closed that PR. He helped kind of contribute ideas into the feature. And then once the feature was in, he opened a PR that was like three lines of code that just used it. Um, was it Ben Adams? So are, no, um, <laughs> uh, 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 Chief Feudal on um, uh, yeah. um, uh, So th yeah, that's an example. Um, we also have access to like our own for our own internal services like we have telemetry you know for data in azure for our for microsoft services running in azure or whatever so we can look at that data and say oh i know that these are hot spots and that's one of the reasons we invested in regex in dotnet 5 and then dotnet 7 is because we knew that it was being used in the following ways um and then once we know that we can go and grab additional information about how they're used so we knew that regex was being used a lot um, but we didn't know exactly what patterns were being used. So we uh, basically scanned all of the appropriately licensed publicly available NuGet libraries uh, looking for where they used regex um, and compiled effectively a database of like 20,000 patterns and how frequently they showed up. And then with that list, we can then run that through our own regex parser and see, oh, like this pattern is common or that pattern is common or this feature is never used. So like when we were building up the regex source generator, we brought features online effectively in the order that would be beneficial. And um, we almost even left features out that were basically never used. Like, you know, uh, regex options that right to left is used by like 0.5% of the regular expressions uh, or 0.05% of the regular expressions on NuGet. But we ended up adding it because the same engine that drives right to left also drives um, look behind patterns, right. which represent about 4% of the patterns on NuGet. So that was worthwhile. We ended up deciding, let's just do everything. And we, yeah. you know, we influenced everything. But in terms of what things to optimize for, you know, we'll, we, we added optimizations based on, all right, well, if we add these optimizations, which patterns from the top 100 will be covered. Okay, great. Those are knocked off. What's left? How? What optimizations could we add that would address those patterns? So we try and get data, very data-driven, like wherever we possibly can. Um, the last one, no special tools other than uh, using regex and grep.app and GitHub searches and just looking to see where these things show up. So, you know, um, certain things are really easy to find or replace. We do a search across all of .NET runtime in Visual Studio for static read-only char array equals new char, whatever, right? Yeah. So you can do that search and find 30 places that you, you go look at them and say, oh yeah, this is worthwhile, this is worthwhile, and you just go and replace them. Um, you do a regex search across .NET runtime for, you know, four some variable equals zero, some variable less than something else, uh, maybe there's a, a brace uh, and then, you know, something that indexes into something and that returns you 120 things to go and look at. And you go and look at all of them and say, oh, this could be an index of any values. This could be an index of any values. And as you're going through them, you also say, oh, wow, I'm seeing a lot of places where people are doing like looking for white space. Maybe we should add a new method index of any white space. Yeah. Or, I, you know, I'm actually not seeing, I, I'm seeing people not just looking for things, but looking for the absence of things. So maybe instead of index of any, we should also have an index of any except, right? And right. That's where these features are sort of often born from is looking over large swaths of code, rolling out one feature, you see all these opportunities to add additional features to kind of help cover as many cases as possible. Because to your earlier point, we really don't want the vast majority of developers having to know about all this stuff. We don't want them having to know about manually vectorizing. We don't want them to have to use hardware intrinsics. I don't even want ASP.NET to use hardware. Like, like one of my goals for .NET 8, one of my personal goals, is to implement enough helpers in .NET runtime in the core libraries such that we can delete all the custom vectorization stuff that shows up in ASP.NET. Uh, because while we want to make all that possible, I really only want you to reach for it if you absolutely have to. And if it's you know, a replace operation, replacing one character with another, like that's an API that we should expose in the runtime. And so we have, right. And um, yeah, I went off on a tangent there, but no, that's, yeah. that's good. I absolutely loved it because it, it really, you know, you can just answer the question with a sentence or you can give me and people all the background in how you go about 
doing those things and it really means a lot to us because I don't know how everyone feels, but you know, if someone knows how to use .NET and C Sharp is Microsoft. Uh, so understanding how you're thinking about writing software can can actually really be adapted to how people are writing software. And at which point do we consider optimizing? Because I don't think anybody wants to be in a situation where you say, oh, if we want to be fast, we have to move to Rust or Go or whatever. It's like, if we want to be fast, we can use everything we have. And then there's the foundation and enough tools here for me to actually go crazy and, and make this super fast if I want to. Um, right. while reusing all the logic, which ultimately is the answer I would be expecting, which is, you know, C-sharp is a fun language. .NET is a, is a performant framework. You wouldn't just ditch all the experience of your team and your experience to move into something new and shiny that, you know, yeah, it's fast, it's good. The borrowing system of Rust, for example, is amazing in memory, but you can do pretty good, good stuff with .NET here without having to ditch all that knowledge. So, interesting background here. There's a question in the chat, and thank you so much, Chris Cobb, for the $10 asking the question. Um, by the way, you don't have to pay to ask a question, just saying that. Uh, but since since he did, um, I might as well include it, which is, the question was, when considering new features on or benchmarking performance, do you ever compare other languages or frameworks with .NET and C Sharp? And if so, um, what's some performance improvement or feature of another language or framework that you're envious and you want in .NET or C Sharp? That's a great question. So since I spent a lot of time looking at this exact kind of thing in .NET 7 with regex, I'll, I'll talk about regex. Um, actually, both .NET 5 and .NET 7. So um, prior to .NET 5, our investment in regex was pretty slim. It had a, it's a very robust full featured implementation that back in 2002, whenever it was written in 2003, it was quite fast, but the industry evolved and .NET's regex did not. And even though it had all the features and more, um, it if you look at industry benchmarks, there are various industry benchmarks for a whole bunch of things, including for regex. Um, we had fallen to basically the effectively the bottom of the list um, there's um, a, a variety of these benchmarks. One of them is called Benchmark Game, and they've got a, a variety of different things. But one of them is a benchmark called Regex Redux. It's a, kind of a faux biology DNA searching okay. thing. Um, and everyone else was better than us. Um, and so our, our goal for .NET 5 for regex was basically bring it up to stuff. We didn't care about being better than anyone else, but we wanted to be at least as good as all the other sort of main players. And where we ended up after, at least according to this benchmark on the hardware that they run on, we ended up being a little bit better than Java, a little bit better than Go, um, but still on that benchmark about twice as slow as Rust. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's this is very specific to that benchmark why that is the case if you look at other regex benchmarks .NET is neck and neck with rust better on some worse than others but rust has and in particular the regex the, the uh, rust regex crate has this really nice um optimization where they're able to vectorize a search for a small number of strings in parallel, effectively. So we can vectorize a search for Nick. We can vectorize a search for Steve. We could vectorize a search for N or S, but they're able to vectorize a search for N-I-C-K and S-T-E-V sort of at the same time. Interesting. Um, and we just haven't had the opportunity to go and implement that. But on this particular benchmark, that is all that it does. Um, it's it's searching for like it's a bunch of regex searches for is it this DNA strand or that DNA strand? So a lot of you know A G C T G C T A, and you're ended up looking for two of them at the same time, and so it it kills everyone else. Um, so I am envious of that feature, uh, and would love for us to add an algorithm like that 
in regex in the future. We do really well on most things, better than some other languages, a little bit worse than other languages, but it, we're no longer at the bottom of the pack now. We're at least as good as most, except in these places where Rust really, like that particular, like the developer who did this work on Rust is, is pretty great. And we've, we've used some of his work um, as inspiration for some of the things that we've done in regex in, um, in .NET as well. I see. Interesting that, again, even there, string related stuff are so so prevalent in, I mean, regex. You know that that's how we actually came in touch for the first time. I I think I did a video, um, a regex related video, and there was a regression in, um, I think the email pattern that I used. Yeah, I think I emailed you to say, can you send that to me? <laughs> yeah, because you said, uh, hey, I'm I'm Steve. I wrote the source generator. I'm like, people know uh, regex. Jesus Christ. And then yeah, we I I sent the the issue, and I'm, I'm sure you sorted it out. Um, but um, it's interesting that what happened with regex because obviously we have the source generator, but previously we had the compiled version in the runtime, which would emit a, a ton of IL, from what I understand. But actually, we had a sort of source generator type of thing. It was code generation, I think, even before that. Which you, you could have a compiled like time generation of that same code, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, when you just say new regex, basically it does all the parsing and optimization and stuff, and then you get this data structure that then an interpreter walks over every time you give an input. Um, you can ask for regex options compiled, which basically at the time it basically effectively unrolled what that interpreter would have done and then generated IL for each of those things. Um, and it would do it using a dynamic method, um, which basically allows you to dynamically create a method with IL emit and compile it. Um, but it's written in such a way that you're just targeting this um, particular type that can abstract over both dynamic methods and method builders. Um, and so the exact same code that backed regex options not compiled was also capable of emitting an assembly to save to disk. Um, so there was a method on regex called regex.compile to assembly, where it would run that code, and then it would assembly builder.save the resulting assembly out to disk. And then you could write an application that would reference that assembly uh, and use it. So yes, it was a very early form of this, just like we've had tools like SGen for XML or other yep. generators. Um, the really, the, the amazing thing about source generators isn't that they're doing something totally novel from a let us emit code at compile time or, or, or you know, pre-execution time, but that you do it as part of the same operation. So the the gymnastics that you would have had to previously do first run an application that calls regex.compile to assembly and saves the assembly out and then reference that assembly from this other project that actually wants to use it and manually construct it source generator allowed us to eliminate all of that and so just it just gets built into your assembly you don't have to do any of these extra ms build pre-compilation steps to target this thing and it just becomes easy um as part of all this work, we also completely rewrote that IL generator, the the IL emit thing. So basically, we the it's sort of this, as we wrote, we, we initially wrote the source generator as a line by line translation of the IL. So if you looked at the generated code, it looked exactly like what you would have gotten if you decompiled the IL that was previously being emitted. But that made it super clear that the code was not great um and so for a variety of reasons we ended up effectively rewriting both of them together in a, a more optimal fashion such that we got nice looking c sharp code out of the source generator and we got more efficient il out of the il compiler um, the structure of the two is identical 
Um, there's a couple places where they diverge because you know there's an additional optimization we can do because of the C-sharp feature. So we'll take that path. But even down to the comments in the source generator and the compiler, there's a block of code and it's the same comment, a block of code yeah. and the same comment. And we're just out, you know, we're basically over here outputting the IL that we would get if we compiled the C-sharp that we're, we're outputting over here. Which is why you'd expect similar performance as well between the two, right? Because they're subject right. to the same JIT, really. Exactly. They, for 99% of it, you expect the exact same perf. Now, do are we generating the exact same IL that the C-sharp compiler in, outputs for the C-sharp? Maybe not. Maybe it's in re reversed the order of branches, or maybe, you know, some loop has been um, uh, switched from a, you know, a while loop to a do while loop or something, right? But for the most part, a nanosecond up here, a nanosecond up there, you expect it to be the same. There are a few places where we've been able to take advantage of things that would just be too much work to do in the compiler yeah. that are easier to do in the source generator. Um, so places that um, we can use a switch statement in C sharp and rely on some of the optimizations that the compiler, it's, it's lowering handles. We'll take advantage of that in the in the source generator and just rely on a simple version of it when we're emitting the IL ourselves, because we don't want to do all of the same analysis that the C-sharp compiler does. Um, or um, with the index of any values thing that I mentioned earlier, right? The, the source generator takes advantage of it now. The IL, the regex options .compile does as well, but there's an interesting difference. You know, again, we're talking nanoseconds, but um, in the source generator, we have full control over all the source that we're able to admit. So if, if, there, if there are five places that we need to use a different index of any values, we can emit five static read-only fields uh, for, for these things. In the IL compiler, we're emitting a dynamic method where the only thing we can really do is emit the method body. We don't have the luxury of emitting additional static read-only fields. So we have effectively a lookup table in an array where we have a, an array that we we access and index into it to get the index of any values. And that's a little bit slower than the static read-only field. Be in particular, not only just the array access, but with the static read-only field, the JIT compiler is able to de-virtualize virtual calls that are getting made on that instance because it sees from the static read-only, it, it knows the concrete type of the type that's actually derived from that index of any values. The way we structure it is there's this base type with some virtual methods, and we have a bunch of different ways we can optimize it via a bunch of different derived types. The JIT compiler knows exactly which one of them that instance is, and so it can de-virtualize the calls that get made to it. Whereas when we pull one of these arbitrarily out of an array in the IL compiler, there is no de-virtualization because as far as the JIT compiler is concerned, it has no idea what the actual concrete type is. So you pay an extra one or two nanoseconds per call to to start the operation. And so there's a little bit of additional overhead there. Um, although uh, this is also the kind of thing where work on things like dynamic PGO in the JIT in theory should be able to help because it should be able to see that at a given call site, we're always accessing the same concrete type and end up de-virtualizing de the call as well. How uh, c -sharp and .NET in general has been be very careful with what is compiled, how much optimization happens during compile time, and what goes into the JIT to be optimized during runtime. And again, that's one of the benefits of having a language that compiles to, to, to byte code. But now with source generators, you also have this extra thing, and you can refer to an amount of packages that can add code, and then they need to be compiled as when the compilation becomes slower. And, you have, you know, depending on how complicated your regex pattern is, that assembly can grow, obviously not in dangerous levels, but again, it depends on how much you use it. So you have an ever-growing and sort of dynamic assembly size, but we don't really optimize too much on the compilation stage. But then you have the JIT, and then how much can the JIT optimize? And I've seen some features that point towards that concern of how much do we do in every situation. You have things like tiered compilation uh, on the JIT. You have on-stack replacement now, which also is an extension of that or steps on it. And 
you go as far as even having environment variables for fast loops, which I found interesting and funny at the same time. Um, how do you deal with keeping the balance and deciding what goes where and, and when do we optimize and when do we just say no? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is a balance. Um, there are, um, I'll, I'll give an example. <clears throat> You mentioned regex again in this context, so I'll, I'll bring it up again. So uh, one of the features that we're looking at for C Sharp and source generators, possibly, is the ability to do a very limited form of replacement, and not just augmentation. Today with source generators, you can only add code, and there's no mechanism for changing existing code. One of the things we're looking at is a compiler feature where I still only add code, but attribute it in a way where the code is basically able to say, dear C-sharp compiler, if you see any calls to X, or you see a call to X on line 123, please replace that with a call to Y. Now, if we add that, then the regex source trainer, for example, could emit a replacement, for any use of regex.ismatch, any use of regex.matches, like it could tell the compiler to replace those calls with something else. And the question is, should it? Yeah. Because if we, you know, if you're using 100 regular expressions in your application and two of them are on your super fast path and 98 of them are this super corner case, never actually executed, only once in a blue moon. Like, do you really want to automatically be causing the developer to spend the additional assembly size automatically optimizing those, when in reality it might be a de-optimization for size on disk or loading time or whatever? So these are very real questions. And, you know, do we make, if we were to do that, would we make it opt-in? Would we require you to make some changes to your code to take advantage of it? Like, what would we just say, ah, to heck with it, opt everyone in and it's not actually a big deal? I don't know the answer yet. We have theories and ideas, but we haven't completely worked it out. Um, uh, but yeah, they're, they're very real concern. Now, for certain environments, it's some aspects of it are no-brainers. So in particular, when you're, you know, what, one of the things that source generators are often used for is to replace runtime reflection and runtime code generation with stuff done ahead of time. Um, that is a, a trade-off that you can have a discussion about when you talk about jitting. If you talk about AOT, ahead of time compilation and native AOT, there's no trade-off. So the feature works or it doesn't. Um, there is no JIT. There is no reflection emit. Um, either you know you're falling back to a slow interpreted thing, or you're doing source generation to get the the compile time code generation, and that also changes the equation. So a lot of the source generators you see us doing right now do have a heavy bent on the, that balance with regards to native AOT. You know the the source generator thing for regex, it's great for a variety of reasons. You know it helps with startup time. Uh, it allows you to see the code. It allows you to debug the code. Lots of benefits to it. But one of the biggest benefits is when it comes to native AOT, because there is no regex options not compiled. If you regex options not compiled with native AOT, it's ignored. It just falls back to interpreter because we can't reflection in it. Yeah. So you, if you look at the difference in performance between regex options not compiled and the source generator running on, you know, core CLR with the JIT, they're neck and neck. If you look at them on native AOT, source generator compiled because compiled is actually interpreted yeah. um and you see the source generators you see us working on now for things like minimal apis where we want to be able to do all of the reflection binding configuration binding method hookup routes all that kind of stuff that normally today happens at runtime uh, we can't do that safely with native aot and trimming and so we want to do it in source generation because it's either a, it works or it doesn't yeah. Um, versus uh, it works a little bit better or, or not. Yeah, I see. The The first thing you mentioned, which is replacing something that already exists with Store Generator, that definitely sounds interesting, especially if the path ahead is native AOT, which by the sounds of it, it is. 
uh, and I'm sure the source generator is. And I'm not sure it's the path, but it is certainly an important path. Yeah, yeah. Because when I asked Damian Edwards, what is he truly excited about? What's coming next? And again, he's more on the web side of things, but very much heavy on the .NET stuff. Um, it was native AOT, and the whole .NET eight moved towards that. Couldn't you technically just replace something that exists using IL weaving? Um, sure. Um, that's not really fundamentally different from uh, source. Oh, you, you meant replace? You, you meant with regards to that compiler feature? Yeah. Yes, they are one in the same. It's again the ergonomics of it. Before source generation, I could pre-compile you know, some kind of .NET assembly and then reference that from my application. And I could do all the same kinds of things that I do with Source Generator other than the sort of real-time feedback. But Roslyn Source Generators added this instant gratification all in the same assembly. Don't need to think about it at all. It just works version right. of it, right? This replacement thing, yeah. If I, I can attribute, you know, I can attribute my method I could even maybe have a scheme where I attribute both the callee and the caller so that I only allow replacing things that I've signed up for, right? Then it's just a question of who does the replacement, right? right. The source generator can output it. Is it the compiler doing it the replacement? Or do I need a separate build tool that does does the rewrite? Yeah. And both are, are valid, but they're both fundamentally the same concept yeah. of uh, allowing me to do minimal replacement. <laughs> we The reason I keep focusing on minimal replacement is more than that, and it starts being really confusing as to, well, I wrote this code, but something else happened. Yeah. And so that's, that's one of the reasons the source generators have never supported rewrite. Not not the only reason, but one of, um, and purely augmentation. Um, what? There are other reasons, including editor performance and things like that. Yeah. What I can totally see happening if you enable that, and I know I will use it if you are to do that, is especially in AOP, you know, aspect-oriented programming, if I could mark something as loggable or metrable with an attribute and then write a source generator that detects the attribute and replaces it with a try finally block to slap a stopwatch um, dot get time span delta, I know I'd use that. Yeah. Because it would make it very easy. Currently you can with IL weaving, but it, it it sort of looks like unexpected behavior to a degree. It's like, what is this really doing here? You can't really debug it, and it's it's very dodgy to do it. So it would be definitely something I'd use, but I'd be worried that anyone will have their own idea of what this should be, and then code that looks a certain way can really hide a lot of stuff you wouldn't expect. Right. Yeah, so these are all ideas we're still playing with. There are people actively looking at it on C-sharp. Um, and how would you know? Maybe maybe it will fundamentally end up as a you know, if if we do it as a, a post build tool that does you know uses Cecil or whatever to yeah. do an assembly rewrite or but um, it could also go the other way. It could be it shows up in the language and we require language syntax in order to say yes, this is replaceable, and that's how you opt yeah. in to having something replaced. So there's a spectrum of things we could imagine, um, and they're all being considered. So. Before I move a bit into the the next section of this, which is more on the previous work you've done for .NET, mostly around uh, parallel and the way they sync and that, which is very fascinating to me, is premature optimization the root of all evil? No, <laughs> I mean, it, there, I say no, but there's no yes or no. There's no. It, now it's, I'm, I'm clipping it, that. I'm saying it's no. <laughs> But it's, I mean, it's all a giant gray area, right? There is, if you know that something is going to be used in a path, or you suspect it might, like making it not be terrible um, is a good thing to do. Um, you know, you know, if, if you if you know that something is just a tool, like when I write a little tool to do some manipulation and compute something, I will totally write string s equals blah, and then in the loop, s plus equals some other string, right? Because it's simple, it's easy, it's throwaway, the perf doesn't matter. And so, yeah, I'm allocating, you know, n squared worth of memory for my strings, but I don't care. Um, but I would never in 100 years write that 
in any library that I allowed anyone else to consume ever, right? Um, and if I saw that, I would go and optimize it because even if one person hit it, um, it's worth it to avoid that huge performance bottleneck. Now, is it worth it to pre, you know, pre-compute the possible total length and stack allocate or use an array pool and write into that memory? And it, like, probably not until it proves that it is. But doing some amount of optimization is valuable. At some point, it stops being. Um, and there are certainly cases where I have said no to things where like, they are totally valid and even useful in certain situation optimizations, but I just haven't seen enough evidence that it's the right trade-off. For example, we have a really nice PR currently pending in .NET Runtime. Super appreciate the author's contribution, but we'll likely close it and just haven't yet, and they know this, <laughs> um, they are, they have vectorized the implementation of enumerable dot range. Mm -hmm. So enumerable dot range dot two array, um, which is, you know, range zero to 10,000 dot two array. Right? So you're filling array with all the numbers zero through nine, 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 nine. Um, the PR very nicely makes that operation N times faster. Which is great. It also adds. 150 lines of code or something that of you know vector 128 and vector 256 or whatever to do so and looking around at usage of enumerable dot range dot two array i can't find a single place that's on the hot path right it's it's all tests it's creating test input or whatever and yeah. do we do i really want another 200 lines of vectorized code to maintain for the benefits not currently. And so I, I wouldn't call that a premature optimization. It is a very, really welcomed contribution. But I don't feel like we can merge it right now because it doesn't have the right trade-offs associated with yeah. it. If someone came up to me and said, actually, Steve, here is a case where I'm using enumerable .two, range two array on a hot path, and there isn't a better option, and this is what I need to be using for some reason, I would absolutely reconsider now having knowledge and it no longer being premature. Yeah. Uh, I use enumerable dot range a lot, but it is exclusively to set up some data, either for tests or to showcase something. Yeah. And that is it. I've never, because it's also such a, a wasteful thing. Like when would you want a serial array of numbers to be allocated in that way. And like, why would it be in an enumerable form in the first? Like, it just doesn't really fit any narrative that I've seen. Yeah, if we were, if, if we found that it was a common pattern that you needed to fill some data with a sequence, you know, monotonically increasing sequence of numbers. Yeah. We would probably instead choose to do memory extensions dot fill increasing or something that would take a span and write that data into the span. And yeah. then it would be a no brainer to change enumerable dot range dot two array to call that method. Yeah. But we would need the justification for that method. Yeah. In the first well, and you don't really need, I mean, you set up some data usually. Yes, you can set up serial data. Yes. But mostly people want just some numbers of N count in an array. And now you have random dot um, get items. So like, fantastic, I'll just do that instead. And it returns, um, it accepts a span as well, it can fill up a span if I want, it's right. fantastic. Um, so I don't really see the reason. So I see I see where you're coming from. I guess for me, the big, uh, oh, the last comment I want to make on, on that discussion is, even if you think that premature optimization is a root of all evil, when the time comes to optimize, you need to know how to optimize and what to optimize. So even if you don't want to do it, when people are talking about optimization, treat it as, oh, if I ever need it, that's what I can do. Yeah. Because you can say I don't need it, but when you do need it eventually, if you need it, how do you go about using it? How right. do you optimize? And, and that is getting back to our very first conversation uh, two and a half hours ago with the, with the blog post. Like the, one of the reasons that I spend the time there documenting how we went about, the approaches we took, the algorithms we employed, what we discovered is so that hopefully that sits in the back of someone's brain 
And when they do profile their application, they say, huh, this is taking up 30% of my CPU time, or this is allocating 17,000 objects. Like, I really need to think of an approach to this. Hopefully, they can reach back into that bag of tricks that they learned, and one of them will be applicable. And then they can kind of, you know, propagate that solution there as well. And with that, <laughs> we can take a breath, and I want to move into a, a whole different sort of domain, which is, I'd say, equally as tricky, and you spend a, a good amount of your career talking about, especially probably more in your um, pile of compute platform team days, uh, and that is await async. Mm -hmm. So await async famously was released uh, in October of 20, 2010. And um, I've never seen a feature released in .NET that was or has been more viral than await async. It's everywhere. And usually the problem with features that are so popular is that people, unless you, unless you set the right guardrails, people can really mess it up. And we've seen it mess it up in so many different ways. Upon launching it, did you expect it to be as viral as it was? Yes. Y you did? Yes. Did you expect... Go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. I was going to be expected to fundamentally transform how people wrote their code. And part of that was because the previous solutions were terrible. Yeah, the spaghetti nightmare before that was... I, at the time, I wasn't really doing anything with, I was not even in uni, I wasn't equivalent of co college, UK college, I guess high school there. Um, and I was just writing VB applications to scam people out of their gaming accounts. Um, it was a dark time. Um, but um, upon seeing it, I've never, because usually that sort of, Appli writing an application that looks like you're writing sequential code, but you have this concurrency baked into it where the, that thread can go do some other work and then when it's ready to come back and finish what it started, allowing you to scale better, is genius. And obviously we're seeing it now in so many other places. Usually you have two approaches in doing this thing. You either have a callback hell, um, or in, in the case of Java, do nothing about it or not actually decide what to do about it. And then with fibers, maybe do something about whatever. Um, or have a way to sync or have coroutines or with go, go routines. Would you, did you expect that people would mess some aspects of it so much and just not understand it at all? And do you think it was due to communication from Microsoft upon launching it? or is just a complicated feature? Before I dig myself into a hole, tell me an example of what kind of mess up you're referring to. Dot result, dot wait, what the hell is that? Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, that is a confluence of, we, we did know that that would be an issue. Um, and if we could go back and, so async await, came out along with .NET Framework 4.5. Task was introduced in .NET Framework 4. And so there was, and, and at the time we released Task, we didn't yet know we were going to do async await. In fact, releasing Task is one of the things that led us to say, hmm, I bet we could do this other thing. Um, and if you're just using Tasks, result is sort of a necessary thing. Right? You need some way to extract the answer from the task. And maybe we could have called it get results and had it be a method instead of a property. And maybe we could have made it throw instead of implicitly calling wait. But from a programming model perspective, both of those made the code actually feel worse. So for tasks specifically, result was actually a relatively reasonable thing to do. Now, I have my own opinions on whether it should have been blocking. I don't think it should have. But that aside, for what we had in .NET Framework 4, I think we, we, if I had to do it again and we didn't have async wait, we would still have a results-like thing, right? Um, then you add async await on top of it, though, and effectively at that point, you're, you're creating a replacement for result. But there's no way to, you know, 
make it go away. We can hide it with Editor Browsable or something. Um, but it still is a thing that you need to do sometimes. Um, and so we end up relying on analyzers and things like that to say, whoa, like, did you really, did you really mean to be, be doing that? And even then, there are cases where you get false positives because there are very valid reasons to call results once you know it's already completed. But there's no way the analyzer you know, can tell that. So I think we did most things right. And there are a couple things we could have done better. I, I would have bet money that what you were going to say wasn't dot result, that you were going to say async void. Uh, oh, I'm going to go there. Don't worry. I made a video of literally yesterday on that. Yeah. Uh, it's not just async void. I think the, the biggest mistake is, well, I don't know if it's the biggest mistake. I think, I think there's many things that could have been done better. Well, again, hindsight 2023. Uh, but I don't think it should have been called a task, that thing. Hmm. I think it should be a promise. Yeah, I mean, other languages call it promise or future. Yeah. Um, and I have a, again, this isn't really async await. This is about task. Um, yeah. And again, I think there are like 90% of the things I think we did with task, I think we got right. And there are things that I would absolutely do differently if I could go back to 2008 and do it over again. Um, part of the problem here, you know, there's the, the, the anecdote or story about, you know, you put a frog into a, a thing of hot water, it jumps out, but if you put it in and slowly turn up the temperature, it boils which to it, death. Which is false, by the way. False. Yeah. yeah. But there's the story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, but, um, it feels, it's always felt to me a little bit like that where you're. And this is a, one of the great lessons that I learned for, from those few years is you know, we, in, we inherited, the task originally started as a Microsoft research project. And it started as a Microsoft research project around, uh, primarily around compute intensive divide and conquer parallelization. So I've got a quick sort algorithm and I wanna be able to very easily split my work into two tasks and have each process half. And then each of those tasks splits into two halves. And, we evolved it significantly from the time that we sort of inherited it as a prototype to the time that we shipped it. And we questioned some assumptions and we questioned some um, design aspects and changed a whole bunch of stuff. But we didn't do that enough. And we didn't back up and reconsider the entire landscape. So like by the time we shipped it, we had added a task completion source to allow you to manually complete these things recognizing that actually this could form this could play a part in asynchrony in the future but at that point we had, you know, we didn't go back and say well if it's going to form you know the basis of asynchrony maybe we should redesign all this stuff about it where we sort of has an inherent compute focused nature to it part of that is the name part of it is task taking a delegate to its constructor part of it is task having constructors at all <laughs> um part of it is this feature that was originally the default and we eventually buried as an opt-in thing, but I wish we had killed off entirely, which is this task creation options that attached to parent thing. Yeah. Um, we just didn't question enough of either the assumptions that were made or how the, the, the industry landscape was changing from the time that we started the project to the time that we ended up shipping it. Um, and if we had, you know, if I could go back, I would absolutely keep with a bunch of the things that we did. And I would make a few fundamental tweaks. Um, not even fundamental, just tweaks to what we did. And I think that would have helped a bunch of things. Well, my next question would be, if you could go back, what would you do differently? Um, I would, well, a few things. I would remove the constructor from task. Um, it is helpful in a few very corner case situations from an optimization perspective but it is not worth it for that. And that constructor today continues to be a drag on what we can do with the perf of, of task because task is now used for everything. And the vast majority of tasks that are created are not associated with delegates. They're the, ace, they're the, the task that's returned from an async method or manually created by a task completion source or wrapping some other asynchronous operation. And yet every single one carries with it a field for a delegate and a field for a task scheduler because the constructor 
stores them. And I, I've taken a few wax multiple times over the years. And well, could I push those off into a conditional week table? Or could I play some trick in the JIT to like, you know, lift those out or manually replace the task under the covers with a different type or whatever, but it's never amounted. It, it just, it, it's this drag on it. Um, plus having a start method on a task is when most tasks, 99.99999% of tasks are already representing something in flight when you get them, having a start method is weird. Yeah. So, and the start method is only there because of the constructors. So I would get rid of that. Um, I would get rid of um, uh, task creation options that attach to parent. So I mentioned that, you know, it started life. And this is one of those things where we didn't fully reevaluate everything we should have. It was done with the best of intentions and the researcher who created this was awesome and had some amazing ideas, but it was fundamentally geared towards a different set of problems than we ended up primarily representing in the end. Um, it was focused on this divide and conquer parallelization. And in those situations, you kind of, if you want to be able to launch your whole operation and then wait on one thing, and you want that thing to sort of implicitly wait on its children and those things to implicitly wait on those children. And that's what attached parent is. You're basically saying this task spun off multiple subtasks. And when I wait on the parent, it's going to please implicitly wait on the children. But by the time we shipped and we had added all the support for continuations, which didn't exist in that initial thing, there was now another arguably better way to represent that same construct, that same idea. And so not only did we have two different ways to achieve the same thing for a certain set of problems, but we still pay a cost to having that attached to parent concept in the implementation. We've, for the most part, managed to make it so it doesn't actually impact runtime cost, um, but it, it has maintainability cost because every time we want to do something in implementation, we have to consider how is this going to impact this feature that no one ever uses, but if they do, this would break it, right? Yeah. Um, and there's all these, if you look at tasks, what happens when you complete a task it goes through all these multiple stages of completion and some of those stages are specifically about attached to parent and so like if it's attached to parent set then we go off this way otherwise we go off this way to avoid all those costs and it just they're called like finish stage one finish stage two finish stage three and it just makes it that much harder for anyone to do anything in the code base um, so i would get rid of that um we had this idea that Again, stemming from that original, that, that heritage of this divide and conquer, that whatever schedule or that a, um, a task is associated with, the delegate, when it runs, if it creates any other tasks, they should implicitly target that same scheduler. Um, and that makes sense for those diverse d divide and conquer problems. I schedule something to run on some scheduler that has five threads associated with it. Any task that it creates, it's doing you know part of the original work. I want it to also only run on those five threads. So I want it to kind of schedule back to itself. Um, but applying that, and, and that's what we did. We basically made, I mean, you, um, by default, unless you specify otherwise, start task factory, start new, targets task scheduler.current which is great for that scenario. Um, and it makes sense for continue with, for the same reason that if you're on a UI thread today and you will wait foo, you want to be back on the UI thread afterwards, it logically yeah. makes sense that continue with would be scheduled to, um, the, uh, to, to where you currently are, by default at least. But it causes non-trivial problems in other cases. So let's say you do that. Let's say you have a continue with, and it's scheduled back to the UI thread. But now inside that delegate that is now running on the UI thread, task scheduler.current is now for the, the UI thread. Now, if you call start new, you're not gonna go off to the thread pool like you thought you were, you're gonna come back to the UI thread. Um, so I think we made a mistake with that default. Um, I also think we made a mistake. And again, this is all 2020 hindsight. And yeah. if you ever watch you know, API reviews, and all of us are commenting on various things. Like we made mistakes and we don't want to repeat them. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the whole learning from your failures. Like you see me, these are the kinds of things that have influenced my yeah. mind. Um, we also went way overboard on overloads, way too many overloads for certain methods, every combination of every parameter. And then we decided to cut back. So we didn't ship a subset, but that subset actually being the one that people care about, like, you know, the, 
the idea of having every option possible for people actually makes the API confusing to use. Yeah. Um, and then um, I think I would have made task completion source a struct, not a, not a class. Um, you can see with like cancellation token and cancellation token source, okay. the cancellation token source is a class and the cancellation token is a struct. That makes sense. I think with task completion source and task, task is a class, task completion source should have been a struct. Um, maybe we, the name. And we do have value task now, if you want the best of both worlds, if you have a hot path that is sync mostly, then you can use yeah. that. But it is, it's more complicated than just, I want, if I just want to create a task and give it to you, I'm just the system dreading task, like I still yeah. have to pay the allocation cost yeah. for yeah, yeah. Or I dive into my bag of tricks and I reach for the uh, async task method builder that's actually used by async methods, which is a struct and it's basically task completion source. Yeah. Uh, and I use that instead. But again, it's not like the primary, the primary thing. Yeah. Um, maybe the name thing. I don't feel as strongly about that, but, you know, maybe calling it promise would have uh, aligned better with JavaScript or, you know, Node.js or something. Um, calling it future would have aligned better with Java. Yes. Um, uh, what about configure await? It is not a mistake. Um, I know people love to hate it, uh, but unless we said that you have to opt in to going back to where you started, um, which would probably have been configure await just the other direction, um, it is a necessary evil. Uh, I, and but for context, I don't think that the mechanism is problematic. I think the name and the value being a Boolean, if you want to do a certain thing, I think doesn't do it justice because you have so, to assume a lot. You have to know what it is to yeah. use it. The name came about because we thought we would be having more overloads with more options. And we've multiple times over the years, we almost had that, right? In .NET 7, <laughs> we added a, um, a, what was it? Uh, await async method for task. Task dot wait async. Um, that started life in the proposal as overload of configure await. That took not just a boolean, but a um, uh, a timeout, a cancellation token. Because basically, it was you know I want to be able to cancel my await. I want to be able to time out my await. Um, can you hold on for one second? I think someone left my refrigerator open. Just one second. Yeah, no worries. Hey, chat, I'm going to entertain you. I lied. Sorry, it was uh, buzzing in the background and it was no worries. Um, so it came about because we were we are configuring the await, like we're configuring how the await behaves and we're going to have all these other options to it. In the end, the only one ended up being whether to continue on the captured context. And today, for 10 years, or 13 years, or whatever, that remains the only option uh, that has been exposed. Um, so if we knew that was going to be the, the only thing, um, maybe it would have been better as suppress context capture, or don't go back to where I was, or... Yeah. <laughs> Um, although even then, like while it is definitely the minority, because there are places where it's important to call it, and analyzers have sprung up to basically say, you know, you're not you turn on this analyzer because you're working on a library, and then it warns you if you ever have an await that doesn't say continue or configure await false. There are places where you do actually want to have the equivalent of not using configure await false, and to shut up the analyzer, you either need to pragma warning suppress whatever or pragma warning disable whatever or you need to use configure await true to basically say and while it's rare like we even have that in in .NET runtime where there are places we we want the default behavior and so we explicitly say configure await true to to make it clear um so i know people don't like the verbosity associated with it and you know especially for developers working on reusable libraries where 
our slash my guidance has always been you should use it everywhere in your library unless you have a really good reason not to. But the the other alternatives were worse. Okay, so that's the necessary evil, let's say. Yeah. Because it means that the 99% case, no one has to do anything. Right. You're writing, you're writing your your application, and there's orders of magnitude more application and service developers than there are reusable library developers. And it's only if you're writing something that needs to work in arbitrary context, arbitrary environments, do you need to use it. Um, and so for those of us who work on libraries, we're the ones who have to append this thing to. Technical. Yeah, because you don't know where that code will be used, so you have to. And it's it way better now in .NET, since .NET Core, and because the synchronization context isn't so much of an issue um, in most but places. You really don't like the name. You can find your own extension method that renames it, and I know a bunch of people that have done that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've definitely seen that. Or um, there's actually, I think part of the 4D project, there is an IL weaver that automatically attaches it uh, during oh. compile time, which is also very handy. I don't necessarily like the lack of verbose in this in this case because you might attach it yourself, really? even though the weaver will actually not add it twice. But and you know there have been a multitude of issues over the years for in in C sharp lang that proposes, including one that I opened that proposes ways of decreasing the verbosity. Yeah. Um, but nothing has ever risen to the level of a a, a truly better answer. Why do you think so many people confuse task with thread and how will I wait a sync with parallelism? Do they still? Yes. I, yes. Yes. Why do you think that's the case? And what I've seen is Microsoft is way better nowadays at documentation and communicating what they're pushing out, mainly because .NET is this open source thing that is being developed in the wild. You can opt in into the API reviews, which I do regularly um, to see how you think about features. And then when the feature is out, you talk about it in great lengths. But I think people still confuse asynchrony with parallelism a great deal. Oh, confuse asynchrony and parallelism. Yes. Yes. I thought you meant, okay, I thought you meant the task and thread thing. Uh, yeah, okay. Th that is the main thing that the task and thread is sort of trying to make it more explicit for, for chat, even though it's not exactly the the exact comparison. I think asynchrony and parallelism is the biggest misunderstanding, which for most people this translates into a way they sync and thread. I mean... Asynchronously, asynchronicity is fundamentally required to have parallelism. Like one is necessary for the other. In order to run things in parallel, you have to have made one of them, launched one of them asynchronously in order for you to be able to run the other one or launch multiple asynchronously so that they're all running together. Um, I think the the real confusion isn't so much about that and it's what what work is actually being done Am I blocking threads or consuming threads in one way, shape, or form while I'm performing this work? Or is there no threading related resource required while this operation is in flight? Right. It's, it's, uh, if I, when I, you know, um, when I send off, a, uh, when I receive on my socket, am I blocking my current thread or am I hooking up a callback to be notified when it completes? And, one of the great things about async await is that it allows you to write the code as if it were the former, but it's the latter, right? One of the worst things about async await is it allows you to write the code like the former, but it's the latter. Yeah. It, because you're, you're hide, you're, the whole purpose of it was to hide the implementation detail effectively of how it works with a little bit of notice in the syntax that yes, there is something special here. This is a wait, this is async. I'm calling something with an async suffix, but otherwise the structure of the program looks the same. And so I think it makes sense that folks are less aware of what's actually happening under the covers. And actually I spent a few hours over the weekend writing a blog post that I've been meaning to write for years, which was 
how does async await really work? Yeah. Um, which hopefully I'll put up in the next, I don't know, week or two or whatever. Um, but highlighting that, what is the transformation that's happening? How is it that we're not actually blocking a thread? What is actually happening under the covers for this to do? So it makes total sense to me that there is confusion around what actually happens when I await because the code, until you understand and learn that the compiler is doing something very complex on your behalf, it looks the same as your normal synchronous blocking code. Yeah, until you look into the lowered code and you see what is being generated behind the scenes. But I would ask you, for the people that you've heard are confused about that distinction, how many of them have looked? They at haven't. The they haven't because you don't have to. That that is the thing. I, I guess some people can com get confused because you can have a thread dot start, but you can have a task dot run as well, and they can look like they behave in the same way. You know, it's this fire and forget. There's something running in the background. And I don't really know how it works, um, but that aspect is completely different from even having a dot, you know, blocking a thread or awaiting a task, which is fundamentally well, and, different. You know, that gets into the question of um, task. A thread is a thread is a thread is a thread. But a yeah. task can, in from an API perspective, can be multiple things, right? There's yes. task.run and you give it a delegate. And so the task represents that. There's task.delay, which represents a timer. There's task. There, there's task return from an async method and represents an operation. And so it's understandable that it's potentially a little confusing what a task actually is, which at the end of the day is just a data structure that someone can shove a completion signal into. That's yeah. all it is, right? We've we've conflated things a little bit by allowing it to store a delegate and having this, but you know, task.run is really just create an event object, queue a work item to the thread pool that runs a delegate. And when that delegate completes on the thread pool, shove the results or the exception back into the task. And that is actually, I think, the greatest thing about task. Just like span unifies arrays, strings, stack memory, interop, whatever, task unifies, creates a singular representation for everything that you could possibly do to launch something asynchronously. Um, and this is one of the fundamental failings for everything that came before task. And to my mind, it's why task has been around. And, you know, we had multiple async models prior to task was released in 2010. And we basically had one since. Yeah. And the, one of the fundamental reasons for that is because prior to task, every single asynchronous operation had a different representation for that operation, right? With, with the APM pattern, with iasync result, you would there was no single um i async result the only way it provided to join with it which is to synchronously block by waiting on its wait handle there's no way to walk up to an i async result an arbitrary i async result and give it something to say hey when you're done invoke this thing yeah um, and because you lack that you had to give something to every single begin method that you called you had to know ahead of time what it was that you wanted to pass to the begin method in order to, to get your your callback um which means you could only do one thing you had to know what it wanted in advance and all of that means that there's no way or no no trivial way no easy way no way that we would ever elevate to the c-sharp language to compose over arbitrary asynchronous operations um you can do it with some tricks and some helper things with a begin call and you but you know, even simple things like task.winall, there's really no good way to write an async result when all for arbitrary async results. With task, you walk up to an arbitrary task created from, they could be representing a delegate invocation, they could be representing a timer, they could be representing the results of your async method, whatever. And no matter where they came from, you can walk up to any of them and say, invoke this when you're done, please. And if you're already done, invoke it now. Yeah, um, you can write a, a when all combinator and a few lines of code that works on any of these things. And C sharp as a language can introduce the await keyword that operates on the results of any asynchronous operation task dot delay task dot run because there is this singular representation that it, you can teach it how to interact with. It's a lot easier to interact with one thing and know how to interact with that than to interact with any possible thing. Now, in the case of C sharp, it's really that one thing is really a pattern. But task ends up providing 
you know, that pattern. In hindsight, obviously, a way they're saying it's very lowering heavy that it's really syntactic sugar against doing that process manually. So actually, if you get the low level C sharp, you copy paste it into high level C sharp, it will work. You, can, you have access to all of those attributes um, and the flow. In hindsight, do you think it should have been implemented in that way on the lowered level? And would it, do you think it would be done differently? So there are basically two ways that you can do this. You can do what we did in 2010 or 29, 2009, 2010. Um, and do a compiler level rewrite. Um, or you can basically push it down to the runtime for the runtime to handle for you, um, which is effectively what Go does with Go routines. And it's what Java does with Project Loom. Yeah. Uh, call it virtual threads or green threads or fibers, whatever you want to call it. Um, that is the other possibility. And we've experimented with that. In fact, if you go into runtime labs, .net uh, slash runtime labs, you'll find that one of the branches there is a green threads experiment. Yeah. Um, and which, by the way, is still built on top of tasks. Yeah. Um, which is an interesting, in fact, it's even built on top of tasks.wait. Well, we, um, we had uh, the podcast, David Fowler, and he actually talked about this. Um, so green threads was one of my future questions. So I'm glad you're covering this now because on top of what you're going to explain now, I want your thoughts on can it live next to a way they sync and threads, real threads like OS threads, and how much more confusion are we going to have on top of that? So um, yes, it can. And I think if we were to do something here, and that's a big if, but we've prototyped it, we have an idea of how we do it. There's still a whole bunch of open issues. One of the biggest one of which is, should we do it? Um, and that's by no means a slam dunk. Um, but if we did it, it would in no way, I, I can't imagine a world where it replaces async await. Right. It would be one more tool in your toolbox. And in particular, a tool in your toolbox for um, bridging the world between a scalable service that's using async await and code that is implemented in that library in a purely synchronous fashion. You know, it, it does IO and it only exposes a read method, right? And so you say, you know, yes, I, I want to await that call, um, but I can't await that call because it only provides this synchronous read that is synchronous. Now under the covers, that read call calls through multiple levels and eventually gets down to socket.receive, right? Synchronous all the way down at least to the socket.receive. But from a consumption perspective, I can say, I'm gonna make up an API, like the one we have in the prototype, await task.run on green thread. And in a delegate, I say library.read, right? So I'm awaiting, I'm, I'm able to maintain my scalability at the call site and I'm awaiting this special version of task.run, which doesn't schedule that to run on the normal thread full threads, it schedules to run on green threads. And on those green threads, it makes the call, gets down to the socket.receive, and under the covers, socket.receive says, aha, <coughs> I see I'm on a green thread. I'm going to actually call socket.receive async, and then I'm going to call dot .wait, which was what we tell people today to never do, yep. right? I'm going to call dot .wait, which calls into tasks runtime code, and that says, aha, I'm on a green thread. So uh, hook up a continuation to this task, take the whole stack, put it off to the side. And in the continuation that I just hooked up, when the task completes, task.continue with, schedule the work item to go back to run the, take the stack, bring it back, you know, and, and keep running. And so able to basically get the scalability or most of the scalability that you would have hoped for in a world where you're trying to do both things. And it, I think my, I could be wrong, but my logical, you know, there's that, that classic cartoon about, we have 15 standards, let's add a new one to rule them all. Now we have 16 standards. I think it's gonna end up, if we do it, I think it will be one more tool in the tool belt. I see. I could be wrong. It could you, take over. But. Do you think it will happen? I don't know. 
Okay. I don't, I don't know that it's worth it. That my personal opinion. That's what I want. I want your personal opinion, not not what's going to happen really, because I I can definitely see it being a cool thing that you can use, but I can also see it adding a lot of friction on top of the existing toolkit. Yeah. Which is ultimately is that like I th I think if we did not have a way to sync. Right. Like Go doesn't, like Java doesn't, then it would make sense. Or more sense anyway. Uh, I know chat is very passionate about green threads. Every time a live stream will have someone who is very knowledge knowledgeable on the subject, they always like, oh, green threads, please green threads. But you have to be pragmatic about what you bring into the framework and the language. So I, I totally understand that. Um, Again, hindsight 2023, if you had to choose between the away testing model or core routines or go routines, uh, what would be your personal preference? Um, if we were starting completely from scratch, uh, it was 15 years ago and we had everything we, we have today and we know today. And we didn't have to worry about special things like UI threads. Um, and we didn't have to worry about some of the things that we haven't yet figured out how to deal with security features and operating systems that make certain things challenging and so on. There is something very nice about not having a bifurcated API of having the synchronous one and the asynchronous one. Um, there's something very nice about having something that feels synchronous because for all intents and purposes it is and the asynchrony is an implementation detail so if we were starting from scratch and we didn't have to deal with all these other factors i would strongly want us to consider the green threads model i don't know that we would end up picking it but there are certainly problems that async await has done a ton of good but there are certainly downsides to it as well right there are you have the synchronous API and the asynchronous API, and you know you have to duplicate your code or come up with interesting patterns for sharing between them. There ends up being a non-trivial amount of code bloat as a result of the transformation. And also, as a result of the transformation, there are certain optimizations that you'd really like the compiler to perform that it could in a green threads world, but it can't really or not well in the async world. You know, inlining, right? Yeah. Um, a super simple function that would be inlined if it was synchronous, but async it bloats out to this stuff and there's it's not going to get inlined, right? Um, flip side, there are costs to green threads as well. I mean, um, every environment that I've seen do green threads has had to do some kind of transition from non green thread to green thread. I right? in go routines, it's scheduling the, the go routine um, because there's additional work that needs to be done when you're running on these linked or cactus stacks to ensure that you have enough, you're growing your stack space, you have enough left, you're moving a huge amount of stuff around. Um, there are costs on both sides. And part of the, the, the goal of doing this several months of a prototype was to understand better what those costs are and where the remaining dragons still are. And, you know, the, the, the prototype was, and the experiment was successful and that we learned a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do it. Um, part of the success was understanding, like, what are the downsides? I see. Well, then I'm not going to focus too much in this discussion because I don't want the, the listeners to get, uh, the ones that really wanted to get discouraged because yeah, yeah, we might still get it. You never know. Absolutely. It could absolutely happen. It's not going to happen in, 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 uh, the eight out of eight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm a bit conscious of time, so I'm going to start well I'm, i want to ask a, a question that is it could be a wrap-up question as well if you could add a feature in c sharp from any language or one that you thought yourself without any limitations what would that be i have some trivial ones that i've wanted for years um uh i for for reasons of what my day job is i've wanted extension everything for forever um, the inability to add extension statics, which hopefully we're going to get in C-sharp 12, 
um, uh, that has been on my wish list for a decade. Um, wow. And, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's, and, and that's largely because for it's super valuable as part of how you factor libraries, how you deal with compatibility with libraries, legacy with libraries, you know, argument exception, argument null exception, throw if null, right? We've rolled that out through .NET runtime, thousands of places, five, I think 5,000 calls this, whatever. But you look at certain libraries and it doesn't show up anywhere. And that's because those libraries not only compile for the net latest, but also for net standard 2.0, for net framework 4.6.2 surface area, whatever. And we can't use it there because I have no way to polyfill an argument null exception throw off null. So we can have a an argument null exception foe dot throw off null and use those in those libraries. But so that that is like at the, the top of, of my wish list. Um, and I realize it's small in terms of what it actually is, but it's consequential in terms yeah. of what it what it means. Um, the whether you love or hate the Rust borrow checker, um, love it because it's you know protects you, and hate it because you have to figure out how many ampersands to add to get it to compile. And <laughs> um, there is something very nice about it where there are certain features i like it is a combination of c sharp and the runtime could provide that would do something similar and we kind of have that to a very limited extent in c sharp 11 with scoped um you're basically promising like this thing will not escape right um but if we could build on that and have it not just be about refs and ref structs but you know, the ability to basically mark anything as scoped and get validation that it won't actually escape would then enable the runtime to do things like automatic stack allocation of reference types. Um, and we've prototyped things like this, but it's never really come to fruition. Um, but I would, I think that would be the, one of the bigger things on my wish list is the ability to at least explore something like that. Some of the other things on my wish list are, you know, coming to fruition. I've I've wanted the ability to um one of the things we we frequently run into is we want to pass an um an arbitrary number of stack allocated things, but today that's not possible. Uh stack alloc in C sharp and in the runtime um only works for basically unmanaged types. Um, so you'll find in probably 10 or 15 places in critical code paths around the runtime, we'll create our own structs that have, you know, eight string fields and we'll um, stack allocate one of those structs and pray to the other side of the team that we never change the layout algorithm that would cause that to be messed up. And, yeah. Um, and features are coming about now in both the runtime and C-sharp 12 that will um, enable us to Kind of have a built-in feature for that and you know the runtime will be able to handle it safely and efficiently and the language will is at least we're on track to whether it actually happens have support for things like param span compiling down to that underlying mechanism or um uh collection literals compiling down to that underlying mechanism and providing you know nice uh, efficient support for creating things from without without allocation yeah, the scoped keyword, I think it came very late in C Sharp 11 and it went mostly unnoticed. I think I noticed it one week before the launch. Or it was, you know, very I mean, late. For the, most part, the, the feature as it is, it's, it's super welcome if you're doing very specific corner case things. Yeah. So we we hit it a, the need for it a lot because we're passing around ref structs as part of builders and um, readers and writers and whatever else. But and that's, you know, when you're handing those things around, that's where it's most impactful. So there were, you know, places where we got to get rid of a, a large amount of unsafe, you know, unsafe keyword code um, with stack alloc to pointers because we couldn't annotate things as scoped. And once we got scoped, we were able to then use stack alloc the way we wanted into spans and so on. So a very impactful feature for a very niche market. Yeah. Well... I'm not gonna torture you with more <laughs> with more questions. I think I think we're gonna wrap it up here on the on the three hour mark, uh, like I promised. Uh, 
Thank you so, so much for being here and answering all these questions. It is really insightful for me and I'm sure for the listeners as well um, to get your very valuable understanding and also knowledge on all of those topics. Um, Thanks for having me. Other than I think I'm losing my voice. But yeah, um, I, after, yeah, after that, I'm losing my voice as well. Uh, so I take, I usually do this on Fridays um, and then on Saturday, I'm just drinking my tea and doing nothing for the whole day. Um, but usually I don't want to just limit it in an hour because what can you say in an hour that's really of substance if you want to dive deep. So having you here and, and drilling into your brain, like, thank you so, so much for being here. Um, and hopefully we can do this again in the future. That'd be great. I'd love it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Chat, say thank to Steve. And I guess have a good one. You as well. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.